85 million casualties versus 16 million. World War II was the most disastrous conflict ever waged on Earth, but how was it many times more deadly than the previous World War? To understand the incredible loss of human life between the two world wars, it's important to know where fighting actually took place in both wars. World War I was so-called because it involved all the major European powers who dragged their colonies into the fighting along with them. It would have been more fair to simply call it Europe's Great War, but thanks to colonialism, everyone got invited to the party. Still, the vast majority of the fighting took place in Europe, with all the costliest battles of the war taking place on the continent. And it was a brutal affair, too. If you were a British soldier, you had about an 11% chance of never coming home again. But the scope of the heaviest fighting was rather geographically limited. When World War II came around, the world was more interconnected than ever up to that point. This by necessity meant that fighting had to be more global. Defeating major European powers no longer meant keeping the war in Europe. While much of the fighting still took place on the continent, Africa saw a fair share of fighting with the Axis push to cut the Allies off from Middle Eastern and African oil. All along Northern Africa still remained the rusted hulks of tanks and armored vehicles that clashed in the massive battles, all in a bid to starve the Allies of precious oil. But this world war didn't just include European players, Japan invited itself to the chat, and its ambition to rule the Pacific put it on a collision course with the allied European powers who still maintained very lucrative colonies in the region. These colonies produced everything from food to all-important rubber to, once more, oil. And Japan just didn't want these resources for itself, it needed them. As an island nation, Japan is relatively resource poor and depends on importing vital resources from other nations. This meant that the West would always have a leash on Japan, preventing it from rising as a major power by keeping its ambitions in check via threatening trade embargoes. The launch of hostilities in Europe was the opportunity Japan needed to take these lucrative colonies for itself, then kick the West out of the Pacific and establish the empire of the rising sun over Asia. Japan had already launched an invasion of China, which itself had been preoccupied with bitter infighting between the nationalists and the communists. These two sides temporarily set their differences aside and tried to repel the Japanese invaders. But Japan was better equipped and trained than the disheveled Chinese forces. China had, after all, just endured a century of humiliation where it was purposefully weakened and exploited by European powers. Despite absolutely dwarfing Japan, it was in no position to resist imperial Japanese forces. China would provide much of the raw materials and manufacturing power that Japan needed to fuel its empire. But there was still one Western power who could ruin all of Japan's ambitions, the United States of America. The US had maintained a strong Pacific presence for decades due to the area's importance to international trade. Despite being the world's fourth largest country, the US had always been a maritime power. That's because of its unique position on the face of the Earth. It is the most important nation between the Atlantic and the Pacific, making it a balancing point between Europe and Asian powers. But U.S. national security strategy hinged on being a powerful maritime power, and the nation was committed to tolerating zero incursion into its hemisphere of the Earth from any other major power, European or Asian. By the time that Second World War rolled around, the United States Navy was rivaling the vaunted Royal Navy, with the express purpose of ensuring that conflict was always far from home. Much of this firepower was stationed in the Pacific, where the United States was keeping a very close eye on Japan. The Japanese expansionism had seriously disrupted U.S. trade in the region, and relations between the two powers were strained at best. The U.S. held the superior strategic position, with its forces capable of defending all important Pacific rubber plantations and oil fields. Japan was heavily reliant on American oil and industrial exports, and as long as this remained the status quo, the U.S. would always hold the leash on Japanese ascension. Thus, in December 1941, the Imperial Japanese Navy struck Pearl Harbor in a bid to inflict catastrophic losses on the U.S. Navy and keep it out of the Pacific for good. At the same time, it launched an invasion of the American-held Philippines, looking to ensure the U.S. had no base of operations in the region from which to counterattack. The addition of the Pacific Theater had just made the Second World War the truly first global conflict, and now fighting raged across the entire face of the planet. In the Pacific alone, it's estimated there were about 25 million casualties, more than total casualties for World War I. Only 6 million of those casualties were combatants. The rest, a whopping 19 million, were civilians. While both sides targeted civilians, with the Chinese and allies inflicting an estimated 1.2 million civilian casualties on Japan, the Japanese Empire killed Chinese civilians for sport, much like Russia in Ukraine today. Most of the civilian casualties were Chinese, with between 7 and 8 million killed by the Japanese in mass slaughters, indiscriminate bombardments, or just falling prey to the ravages of war itself. An estimated 200,000 Chinese civilians were killed over six weeks in Nanjing alone, as the Japanese army turned killing into a contest. 
The addition of the entire new theater of war skyrocketed the total casualties for the Second World War, but technology would also turn this into the bloodiest conflict in human history. At the onset of World War I, the airplane was a curiosity that most military commanders didn't quite know how to deploy. They knew it could make for a handy scout, though, and thus it replaced observation balloons in both armies, giving commanders a true bird's-eye view of enemy positions for the first time. Information is power, though, and soon both armies started trying to shoot each other's planes out of the sky. The first aerial duels took place with pistols and achieved very little, but soon machine guns were being loaded onto airplanes as their engines became increasingly powerful. Some enterprising minds saw the potential of the airplane for directly attacking enemy positions from the air, though, and while machine guns were nice, if you really wanted to have an impact on the front, you needed to deliver mass death from the sky. Airplane engines were still pretty weak, so the first aerial bombardment weapons were sharpened darts, carried aloft by the hundreds and dropped over the front. These sharp darts would fall from a great distance and if they scored a hit could be lethal for a soldier, creating a deep, wide wound that was impossible to stop bleeding. However, the darts were inaccurate and very few of them actually ever found a target. If a dart missed, like most did, it presented little more than a tripping hazard for enemy soldiers. Grenades were soon being chucked out of the open cockpits of airplanes, but engineers dreamt of more. Bigger airplanes capable of carrying much more bombs, enough to have a significant impact on enemy units. The first bombers could only carry between 55 and 120 pounds of bombs, but soon aircraft like the Russian Ilya Muromets could carry as much as 1,500 pounds of bombs. The future was clear, airplanes would become the most important weapons of the next World War. When World War II broke out, Hitler's armies made excellent use of fighter and bomber aircraft as part of their blitzkrieg or lightning warfare. Pummeling enemy defenses from the air before the ground forces arrived helped soften them up for a ground attack. In the Pacific, Imperial Japan proved the age of the battleship was at an end when it nearly succeeded in defeating the United States of America in a single strike with aircraft launched via carriers. The airplane allowed massive bomb loads to be carried hundreds or even thousands of miles, and in numbers, planes could put entire cities under siege. Today, the accepted way of fighting a modern war is to engage enemy troops and destroy military and economically important targets. Civilian populations are off-limits, and it's no longer acceptable to target them purposefully as part of your strategy to defeat the enemy. In World War II, the mass slaughter of civilians was the strategy for defeating the enemy. If a civilian population could be eradicated, the economic fallout would make it difficult or impossible to continue prosecuting a war. Mass killing of civilians also demoralized the enemy, prompting nations to sue for peace. Thus, in World War II, the targeting of cities was not just fair game, but key to success. In the First World War, civilian deaths numbered at around 10 million. In the Second World War, civilian deaths were twice as high as military deaths, at around 50 to 55 million, and the airplane made much more of that slaughter possible. During World War I, the artillery piece was the upper limit of how far one could threaten an enemy, typically a range of a few miles. With most fighting in World War I happening outside of population centers, this puts civilians at low risk from direct combat deaths, with many of the deaths occurring due to the follow-on effects of the war, namely starvation and disease. However, in the Second World War, airplanes could threaten cities an entire nation over, or even further and they could bring with them thousands of pounds of bombs, with bomber formations sometimes numbering in the hundreds, indiscriminate bombing campaigns leveled entire cities, but special types of bombs made the killing much more efficient. Often cities were targeted with incendiary munitions or bombs designed to create little blast damage and instead fuel massive firestorms. The German city of Dresden was one of the victims of World War II firebombing and turned the entire city into a concrete skeleton covered in ash. Incredibly, the city was reduced nearly to rubble in just three days, with 3,900 tons of explosives and incendiary devices dropped on the city by the British Royal Air Force. Such massive devastation in such a short period of time was unheard of in World War I and would have surely shaken both Allied and Central Power commanders to the core. But in the Second World War, the deaths of 25,000 civilians in three days was just par for the course. In the Pacific theater, though, air raids on civilian cities reached new catastrophic heights. While more civilians died in Europe, Japanese civilians were particularly vulnerable to air raids by the time that the strategic bombing campaign of Japan began in 1944. With Japan refusing to surrender, the Allies began to plan an invasion of the Japanese islands. To weaken Japan for the coming invasion, and to attempt to convince the stubborn Japanese and to surrender before such an invasion, unrestricted bombing of the Japanese islands was approved. At first, air raids took place against military and industrial targets. However, major Japanese industrial centers were quickly reduced to rubble. By now, Japanese forces were so starved of fuel, trained pilots and planes 
that they couldn't mount much if any resistance against air raids. Anti-aircraft guns on the ground were nearly useless, as they had difficulty reaching the high-flying American B-29s. With the loss of major industrial centers, the Japanese dispersed their industrial efforts across their cities to homes and small workshops. This made them much harder to target and neutralize, which prompted the approval of mass bombings of the civilian population. Japanese cities were not just poorly defended from the air, but were particularly vulnerable to bombing. Very quickly on, the United States realized that using conventional high explosives was not very effective against Japanese cities, due to the fact that most buildings were constructed out of wood. High explosives were designed to destroy brick and mortar European cities, but Japanese cities were much more vulnerable to incendiary devices. Thus, US bombers began to drop incendiary devices by the thousands over Japanese cities, sparking massive firestorms that raised cities nearly entirely. It wasn't just the massive volume of bombing carried out by the US, but also poor organization of civil defense that led to the massive destruction of Japanese cities and loss of life. Bomb shelters had never been created in large numbers in Japan, and it's unlikely the nation ever believed it would be subjected to the same massive bombing it was carrying out against Chinese cities. Without bomb shelters, civilians had nowhere to shelter from the flames that spanned entire cities, and they were incinerated in the streets. But Japanese firefighters were also poorly trained and equipped for combating blazes, and this led to the fire raging completely out of control with no hope of stopping it. People may remember the nuclear bombs dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, but massive aerial campaigns had so dwarfed the killing of the atomic bombs that when news of the total casualties from the bombings reached Imperial Japanese command, they were mostly unperturbed. It was only the realization that a single bomb had caused so much devastation that gave them any cause. On the ground, the development of mobile warfare also helped fuel the massive casualties of World War II. Before World War II, troops moved largely on foot, and this limited both the speed and scope of an advance. Forces couldn't spread out as widely or move as quickly as when warfare became mechanized. The marriage between tanks and mechanized infantry allowed warfare to become much faster, cover much more ground. This in turn meant that more territory could be covered, spreading the scope of the fighting and putting more civilian populations at risk. And nowhere did mobile warfare have a dramatic an impact as in the Eastern Front. In the First World War, Russia was defeated relatively early, and the German army didn't require an invasion to force its exit from the war. The violence resulted in an estimated 8 to 10 million dead, with many more that number wounded. In the Second World War, the Eastern Front saw a staggering 40 million dead, about four times World War I's figures. The invasion of Russia opened up an entire new front to the war that had been very limited in the First World War and Hitler's brutal push to Moscow ended up making it the deadliest theater of the war. But Hitler was also busy pumping up his numbers by engaging one of the greatest atrocities in human history. Hitler dreamt of a pure Europe, one free of any race but the Aryan race, with perhaps a token number of survivors of other races to be used as slave labor. To make his sick fantasy a reality, he initiated wholesale industrial slaughter of anyone he deemed undesirable. To make his list, one only needed to be of another race or an undesirable political ideology or be disabled. Hitler's dreams of a pure Third Reich left no room for anyone who wasn't whole in body and mind, prompting the mass slaughter of individuals with special needs. The best-known victims of the Holocaust are the Jewish people, who suffered between 5 and 6 million of their number killed in concentration camps and mass slaughters across Germany and occupied territory. As the German army conquered new lands, they began the systemic removal of all undesirables, herding them into ghettos where they were quarantined until transportation could be arranged to either work camps where they would live as slave labor or extermination camps. While inside cramped ghettos, they would be walled off from the outside world by barbed wire, armed guards, and often hastily erected concrete enclosures. Food was sparse, and mass starvation along with the disease led to the death of many long before the trucks and trains arrived. Often populations would be sorted either before being loaded onto trains or shortly after. From there, some selects deemed healthy or skilled enough would be sent to labor camps to work for industrial, German, and military goods. The rest, what the Nazis considered human chattel, were marked for extermination and sent directly to their deaths. This would often happen by instructing prisoners to strip nude and enter massive shower facilities. This was for their own health, they were told, but once they were inside, the doors were locked and all ventilation sealed. Then the deadly gas was pumped into the room, often causing agonizing death via asphyxiation. Dying inside a Nazi death chamber could take up to 15 minutes, and some even survived after being buried alive by corpses, only to be shot to death by Nazi guards after. But while the Jews suffered the most from the Nazi extermination efforts, they were far from the only populations of the Nazis killed in mass. 
As the Nazi armies poured into the Soviet Union, Hitler wanted to wipe out the indigenous population completely, so that Russia could be turned over into one giant pure German colony. To that end, he ordered a whopping 5.7 million Soviet civilians to be put to death, many of them simply lined up and gunned down in vast rows. Massive pits would be dug, in front of which the Soviet prisoners were lined up, and as machine guns mowed them down, they would fall inside. Then a new row of prisoners would be lined up to meet the same fate. When the pit was nearly full, the Germans ordered the dirt to be spread out over it. The next group to suffer at the hands of the Germans were Soviet POWs. While the rules of war dictated that POWs were to be treated humanely and the Germans treated Western POWs relatively well, in the East, German armies engaged in wholesale slaughter of captured Soviet forces. An estimated 2.8 to 3.3 million Soviet POWs were killed during the German invasion. Poland, which had been the first nation to suffer Germany's wrath, saw also up to 3 million of its citizens put to death. As many as 600,000 Serbs, half a million Romani, 25,000 Slovens, and 3,500 Spanish Republicans fighting against Hitler were also exterminated. Hitler's drive to purge undesirables also spread to the disabled both at home in Germany and occupied territories. Approximately 270,000 disabled people were killed by the Nazis. Political or religious ideology was also a reason for extermination, with as many as 200,000 Freemasons exterminated alongside up to 5,000 Jehovah's Witnesses. Hitler also targeted homosexuals in Germany and the territories he conquered, killing as many as 25,000. The wholesale slaughter of entire populations was one of the major reasons why the Second World War was far deadlier than the first. For the first time in history, mankind had industrialized mass murder, and had the war lasted longer, these casualty numbers would be astronomically higher. In fact, it was Germany's later troubles in the war that actually prevented even more killing. As war materials began to run short, Germany could no longer afford to transport hundreds of thousands of would-be victims to waiting extermination camps, and the drain on manpower and resources caused by the actual fighting spared many from Nazi killings. Adolf Hitler was an idiot, and that's a good thing because it led him to make some really bad strategic decisions during World War II. If Hitler had been a little smarter, we might very well be living in a messed up Nazi-controlled world full of Hitler youth today. Luckily, that's not how history played out. As we progress through some of Hitler's worst decisions during World War II, you might be surprised to find that it was his ego, the name of an enemy, and his belief in the occult that partially cost him the war. Let's start at the beginning. When you're a genocidal maniac like Hitler, your choice of allies can end up being pretty slim. One of the main reasons that Hitler's Nazi Germany allied itself with Italy was because no one else was crazy enough to join him but Benito Mussolini. Most historians argue that Italy wasn't Hitler's first choice for an ally, or even his second or third choice, but when your entire platform is predicated on mass genocide and ruling the world in your own deranged way, not many people can be convinced to get on board. It was Mussolini's authoritarian rule and his dislike for Jewish people that made him the perfect ally for Hitler. However, allying himself with Benito was the first mistake Hitler would make that would eventually lead to him losing World War II. During wartime, you want a strong and independent ally who will have your back when things get tough and can bring something meaningful to the table. Mussolini's Italy was none of those things. Time and time again, Germany would have to bail out Italian forces as they continually became pinned down or surrounded by allies. This would cost Hitler greatly, as Germany would lose valuable resources and men whenever Italy failed its missions. Choosing the wrong ally was definitely one decision that cost Hitler in the long run, but it would not be the only one. The way he handled the North African campaign started in 1940 ended up being a disaster to his cause. World War II started in Europe on September 1, 1939, when Nazi Germany invaded Poland. Axis forces swept across the continent, securing strategic positions and decimating anyone who stood in their way. However, the same cannot be said about their campaign in North Africa, as it was brought to a grinding halt by an unexpected force. The main objective of the North African campaign was to secure the Suez Canal, which would allow the Nazi forces to have better access to oil coming from the Middle East. The Nazis had some of the best tanks aircraft and naval vessels in the world, which gave them the upper hand in many battles. However, without oil to fuel these vehicles, they were useless. Originally, Hitler left Italy in charge of securing North Africa while he focused on decimating Western Europe. This was his first mistake. Italy had trouble defeating Allied forces in the region from the beginning, and Hitler had to send his men and tanks down to bail them out. The distance between Germany and North Africa meant this would take time, but it had to be done if the Axis powers were going to control the region. Eventually, Hitler decided to send General Erwin Rommel to the region to command the German tank forces in North Africa. His mission was to sweep across the continent from Morocco to the Middle East, and once there, he'd be in charge of maintaining control of the vast oil reserves in the region. This was a wise strategic move for Hitler. 
but the execution was performed poorly. After some initial success, things started to fall apart in North Africa. The main problem was that Rommel just didn't have the resources or tanks necessary to get the job done. Rommel made it as far as Tobruk in Libya before he ran into some issues. He was able to capture the seaport of Tobruk, but once the Nazi forces began their advance further east, they were stopped by British General Bernard Montgomery and El Alamein. For 12 days, Nazi and Italian forces tried to break the British line without success. Hitler was furious with a lack of progress in North Africa. After a second defeat at El Alamein, Rommel returned to Europe. He complained that he should have been left with the tank battalions in North Africa, where he was sure he could eventually defeat the Allied troops. However, whether it was Hitler's direct orders or his influence over the Nazis' military, Rommel was forced to stay in Germany while his forces in North Africa were defeated. The Allies had secretly landed more troops in Morocco and Algeria. They charged across the region and eventually trapped the retreating Axis forces. Altogether, around 250,000 German and Italian troops were captured. This would be a definitive turning point in the war to control North Africa and led to a huge disruption in the oil supply that fueled the Nazi war machine. As a side note, Rommel was later accused and convicted for playing a role in the 20th of July plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. This led to the general being given two options, execution by the state or death by suicide. On October 14, 1944, Rommel bit down on a cyanide capsule and ended his life and career as a Nazi general. There's no clear evidence that Rommel actually played a role in the assassination attempt on Hitler's life. This may mean that rather than having a traitor killed, Hitler made the mistake of eliminating one of his best generals, as Rommel is traditionally seen as a brilliant brilliant commander in the field, and Hitler's mistakes would keep on coming. The United States played a major role in securing victory for Allied forces in Europe. However, one of the main reasons that the USA sent troops to Europe was because Hitler made the mistake of declaring war on the United States first. The US was sending supplies and resources to the Allies in Europe from very early on in the war. However, they had adopted somewhat of an isolationist policy and had no plans of directly intervening in Europe until December 11, 1941. That's when Hitler made another decision that would cost in the war. Early on in 1941, the United States had not sent or had plans to send troops to Europe. Then Pearl Harbor happened. Hitler had no idea that the Japanese were going to bomb Pearl Harbor, but he had hoped from the beginning that Japan would pull the US into a war in the Pacific. This would cause them to focus their attention on the other side of the world, likely reducing the amount of supplies they were sending to Britain. Instead of letting those events play out, Hitler did something really dumb. He started attacking American supply ships in the Atlantic and immediately declared war on the US. Hitler was delusional, and he thought even if he destroyed American convoys and declared war on the country, the US would still be too preoccupied with Japan to retaliate. However, nothing could have been further from the truth. The United States' economy was incredibly strong and had already begun ramping up wartime production. They had the men, the resources, and now the motive to fight a war on two fronts. At the time, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was still on the fence about whether troops should be sent to Europe or if the United States should solely focus on Japan. But Hitler's decision to declare war on the US prematurely made the decision easy for him. America would go to war with Nazi Germany and kick their ass, and Hitler only had himself to blame. Just to put it in perspective on how big of a mistake this was, every year of the war, the United States constructed twice as many planes and war vehicles as Nazi Germany did. The United States also had immense resources and a huge labor pool to pull from. With everyone now united under the declaration of war against the United States by Adolf Hitler, the whole country put everything they had into the war effort to defeat Nazi Germany. In the summer of 1941, Hitler would make a decision that would cost him enormous enormous amounts of men, resources, and pretty much the war itself. On June 22nd, the Nazis launched Operation Barbarossa. At the beginning of the war, Hitler was smart enough to have Soviet Russia sign a non-aggression pact, which ensured that they wouldn't attack Germany from the east. This allowed him to focus his attention on Western Europe and defeating Great Britain. However, Hitler was not smart enough to not break his own pact. He launched an invasion into Russia, which meant Germany now had to fight countries to its east and west, defeating the purpose of preventing a two-front war. This decision was a huge mistake and one of the critical factors that cost him the war. At first, Nazi Germany seemed to have the upper hand. Stalin was delusional and thought that there was no way Hitler would break his promise and invade Russia. But this was Adolf Hitler we're talking about, and he obviously couldn't be trusted. The Germans amassed forces along the Russian border. In fact, they weren't even very discreet about it. Hitler had always planned to invade the Soviet Union. He just wanted to wait until all of Europe was under his control first. However, with resources running low and the need for a new source of labor, Hitler launched his invasion early. He fully committed to this decision, even though many of his military advisors warned that conquering the Soviet Union and fighting a two-front war would be incredibly difficult, if not impossible. He ignored them and launched the offensive into Russia anyway. At the beginning of the invasion, the Nazis were winning almost every battle. Hitler patted himself on the back for a job well done in Scotland 
scoffed at anyone who was still wary of sending troops into Russian territory. History has shown that trying to take over Russia never works out well for the invading force. Nazi morale was high as they marched further and further into the Soviet Union. The dirt roads were passable in the summer months and the Nazi uniforms provided enough warmth to stay relatively comfortable even at night. Hitler was so convinced that the war in Russia would be over quickly that he held off on sending more supplies and winter gear to the troops who were advancing further into the Soviet Union. But as the winter months approached, the weather began to change. The tide of the war in Russia was about to shift. Operation Barbarossa was a massive offensive with three different attack forces spread across approximately 1,800 miles of land. As all three parts of the German army started to reach their objectives, they were slowed down by terrible weather, lack of food, and depletion of resources. The Russian people destroyed their own villages, farms, and factories as they retreated further into the Soviet Union to get away from the Nazi invasion. Hitler's original plan had been to resupply his troops using Russian resources as they made their way across the country. It was too long a distance to constantly be resupplying his forces from Germany. Plus, the whole point of invading the Soviet Union was to secure more resources. However, the Russian people left very little of use behind due to their scorched earth policy. When the northern offensive reached Leningrad, they thought that it would fall quickly as the rest of Russia did, but this was not the case. The Germans couldn't manage to secure Leningrad from the Russians and resources were running dangerously low. On top of that, the Nazi forces in the south also ran into trouble. They were stopped dead in their tracks by entrenched Russian soldiers and couldn't advance any further. Hitler was furious. He ordered the middle offensive to send troops to the north and south, which weakened the middle force while not improving the situation in the other regions by much. The slowing down of the German advance allowed the Soviets to regroup. Over a million troops and a thousand tanks were sent to Moscow to protect the capital. The Nazis were now stopped on all fronts. They couldn't manage to take Leningrad in the north, and due to their Soviet reinforcements in the middle of the country and the changing of the weather, capturing Moscow was a lost cause as well. It was becoming more and more clear that Hitler's decision to invade Russia was a huge mistake. The Germans had not brought enough winter supplies due to Hitler's overconfidence. He also gravely underestimated the resilience of the Russian people and how many of them would join in the cause to stop Germany from taking their land. Stalin had a huge population to fuel his war machine, and the resources contained within the Soviet Union's borders allowed them to quickly resupply, while the Germans struggled to get simple things such as food and warm clothes to their troops. While the invasion of Soviet Russia was failing, Hitler seemed to lose his mind. He started blaming everyone else for his bad decisions. This led to another huge mistake. Rather than listening to his generals and advisors who knew more about war than he did, Hitler decided to make himself commander-in-chief of the Nazi army. He couldn't believe that his troops hadn't yet secured Russia. They would have to double their efforts and anyone who ever mentioned the word retreat would be executed. Everyone who had been serving on the front lines of the war knew that trying to subdue Russia and take its capital would be a lost cause. But Hitler would hear none of it. He wanted Moscow to fall, and he wanted it bad. So he put himself in charge of the military to make sure that no one did anything rash like withdraw and come up with a better plan. Hitler was going to take Russia or lose the war trying, which is exactly what he did. He had to put himself in an unwinnable position, fighting two fronts while also bringing the United States into the fray. And he was quickly running out of resources. Things were about to go from bad to worse, and it all had to do with Hitler's next few decisions. Hitler often let his feelings get in the way of making good wartime decisions, and perhaps there's no better example than the Battle of Stalingrad, which began in August of 1942 as part of the Nazis' southern advance into Russia. The city was a manufacturing hub for the Soviets, which meant it had great strategic importance. The Nazis did not necessarily need to secure the entire city in order to disrupt the Russian supply chain. Instead, all they really needed was to blockade Stalingrad to make sure nothing got in or out. However, Hitler had something else in mind. For Hitler, there was almost nothing more important than taking the city of Stalingrad. Not because of its importance, but because it was named after Joseph Stalin, the then leader of the Soviet Union. Hitler believed that it'd be a huge blow to Russian morale and a huge boost to his own ego if the Nazis took the city bearing the leader's name. To be fair, Stalingrad would have provided the Nazis with desperately needed fuel and supplies, but Hitler couldn't help but let his feelings get involved in this wartime decision. For three months, the Nazis tried to take the city. They were unsuccessful due to Hitler's obsession with conquering Russia on all fronts rather than focusing his troops on one location. The Nazis even had taken much of the oil fields and resource-rich areas of Ukraine and Crimea. But rather than holding the line and coming up with a better plan, Hitler ordered his troops forward to the meat grinder of Stalingrad. 
This was a huge mistake because it left their rear flank vulnerable to counterattack. Whether Hitler realized this and just didn't care or he was too focused on taking Stalingrad to notice is up for debate. Regardless, Soviet generals did notice and they sent a force to attack the rear guard of the Nazi army. The Soviets managed to break through the Nazi defenses and surround them. This allowed the Soviets to cut off desperately needed supplies by capturing military bases and airfields as they tightened their hold in the region. Hitler ordered General Friedrich Paulus, who was in charge of the Nazi forces in southern Russia, to continue fighting or be court-martialed and let someone else take over. Paulus decided to take the third option and save the lives of many of his men as possible by surrendering to the Soviets instead. Due to Hitler's crazed attempt to take Stalingrad, which was done mostly because of the name, the Nazis lost hundreds of thousands of men in southern Russia. After Stalingrad, there was no hope of Hitler turning the war around. The Nazi forces were now retreating back toward Germany, the Soviets capturing anything they left behind and wiped out Nazi forces that got in their way. By the beginning of 1943, not only had Hitler lost millions of troops and vehicles, but he was losing the confidence of his people. The low morale of civilians and military personnel alike would cause the Nazi war machine to be less effective. Early footage of Nazi rallies show huge crowds of enthralled people hanging on Hitler's every word. However, after the Eastern Front began to collapse and the threat of a Soviet invasion loomed on the horizon, the German people started to panic and lose faith in their fearless leader. The final nail in the coffin was the failed attempt to invade the Soviet Union and secure Moscow and Stalingrad. This wiped out any remaining morale left in the German people. To make matters worse, Winston Churchill and Franklin Delano Roosevelt had just met in Casablanca and decided it was time to commence bombing runs on German soil. This led to death and destruction at home, which the German people had not experienced up to this point. It was a real eye-opener that their Fuhrer might not be able to deliver on all the promises he made, and the war might be in fact a total loss. At the end of the summer in 1943, incendiary bombs were dropped on Hamburg. The destruction and fire they caused destroyed practically the entire city and killed around 40,000 people. After the bombing run, approximately 900,000 Germans were left homeless. The war had now become very real for the average German citizen. It also became clear that many in the military were losing faith in the Fuhrer. Over 20,000 Nazi troops were court-martialed and executed for various reasons, most of which stemmed from their lack of confidence in Adolf Hitler. Without the trust and enthusiasm of his people and military personnel, there was no way that Hitler could win the war. The only thing worse for Hitler than having the Russians closing in from the east, Italy falling apart in the south, and military supplies running low on all fronts would be if the British and Americans somehow managed to land in France and secure a foothold on mainland Europe. On June 6, 1944, Hitler's worst fear came to be. On top of being crazy, egotistical, and power-hungry monster, Hitler was also gullible. He allowed the Allies to trick him and his generals into deploying troops at the wrong locations along the Atlantic Wall as D-Day was carried out. The Allies knew they'd be landing at Normandy, but they definitely didn't want Hitler to know that, so they used false radio broadcasts, dummy aircraft, and misinformation to trick Hitler into moving his forces away from the actual landing zones. The plan worked and when Allied forces stormed the beaches, they met much less resistance than they would have otherwise. There's no doubt that the D-Day invasion was a gruesome and terrible moment in World War II history that cost the lives of thousands of Allied soldiers, but it ended up being successful because of the Allies' ability to trick Hitler. With Allied troops now on mainland Europe, there was nowhere to run. Nazi forces were recalled back to the Fatherland as an invasion of Germany was now imminent. All of the key events mentioned thus far were not the only reasons Hitler lost the war. There were some factors that Hitler handled poorly throughout the entire conflict that led to his demise. These can't be pinpointed to a specific event or battle, but instead show how a bloodthirsty tyrant can let his vision for world domination get in his own way. Perhaps the biggest mistake that Hitler made was overextending his forces. This was such a problem because throughout the war, maintaining supply lines was a huge issue for the Nazis. They constantly found themselves in need of more resources, the most important of which were fuel and food to supply their vehicles and troops. In the initial months of the war, Axis power secured vast amounts of land across Europe and North Africa. However, this meant that supplies and resources needed to travel incredibly long distances to reach troops. Vehicles and ammunition that were made in Germany could take weeks or months to reach the front lines. Might sound crazy, but Nazi Germany even had to rely pretty heavily on horses to transport supplies to some regions due to a lack of vehicles and landscape. This meant Hitler's war machine moved quickly at first, but then came to a grinding halt. 
as supplies took forever to get where they needed to go. If he was somehow able to quickly move the resources and his troops needed throughout the entire war, it's likely Hitler could have won. The German supply line also forced Hitler into one of the biggest mistakes in World War II. Nazi forces needed oil, and they needed a lot of it. This was the main reason why Hitler invaded the Soviet Union. If he had been able to secure oil, steel, and food from any other source, he could have avoided starting a war with Russia, which would have meant Germany wouldn't have needed to fight a war on two fronts. Therefore, it was the lack of resources and supply line issues that were the overarching cause that led to Adolf Hitler losing World War II. Perhaps the most surprising factor that led to Hitler's defeat wasn't anything to do with the military or supply chain at all. Instead, perhaps his obsession with magic and the occult was a driving factor behind some of his worst decisions. The Nazis' fascination with the occult wasn't just made up to create Indiana Jones movies. Instead, mysticism played a pretty important role in Hitler's decision-making policies. For example, the Nazis were constantly on the search for the Holy Grail, as the promise of everlasting life was a huge draw for Hitler and his entourage of occultists. Hitler and the rest of the Nazi leadership were not Christians, but they still believed that certain relics were imbued with mystical powers. But the search for mystical relics was only one aspect of Hitler's use of the occult. He actually used pretty strange practices to help make some wartime decisions as well. Some accounts report that Hitler and Nazi military leaders frequently used a pendulum and dousing rod to determine the location of allied warships on maps of the ocean. These devices have no actual magical powers or any measurable effect on determining the location of an object, including naval vessels. So any decisions made using these techniques would be as good as if Hitler had just closed his eyes and randomly pointed to an area on the map with his finger to determine where the Allied forces were. Other important military decisions were made under the advisement of astrologers, magicians, and tarot card readers. Again, there is no scientific basis that any of these practices can have a positive effect on wartime decisions. Belief in the occult and mysticism definitely played less of a role in Hitler losing World War II than the other factors discussed in this video, but you can't help but wonder how many of his bad decisions were actually the result of following the advice of psychics or in pursuit of some magical artifact. World War II has many endings. For some, it ended in a Berlin bunker. For others, it happened when a formal declaration of surrender was signed in France. Even after these events, World War II continued to rage on in the Pacific, until a final ceremony was held aboard a battleship in Tokyo Bay. The craziest part is that World War II didn't actually end for several more years after these events for some people. In official documents and textbooks, two major events signaled the end of World War II. But what actually caused the Axis powers to finally give in to demands of the Allies? World War II started on September 1, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. The war was officially declared over six years and one day after this event on September 2, 1945. During this span, approximately 3% of the world's population would be lost. For many in Europe and the surrounding region, the official end of the war came when Germany was defeated. This was because European countries had fewer resources and men in the Pacific theater, and therefore were much more focused on the war at home. The United States and countries in East Asia, on the other hand, would continue fighting World War II for many more months. So for all intents and purposes, World War II actually came to an end for different parts of the world at different times. Obviously, the end of the war for Hitler happened when he shot himself in the Fuhrer bunker, and even so, the fighting in Europe would continue for several more days. But how did the Axis powers find themselves in this predicament? Germany had swept across and held most of Europe for three years without much of a problem. It was a series of big mistakes that would lead to the end of the Third Reich and the war in Europe. The beginning of the downfall for the Axis powers in Europe happened when Germany decided to invade the Soviet Union and fight a war on two fronts. Hitler thought that he could easily overpower the Soviets and then focus his attention on the rest of the Allied forces to the west, but that was not the case. As the Soviets retreated deeper and deeper into the frigid homeland, the Axis powers were spread thin. The brutal climate, lack of food, and the Soviets' scorched earth policy led them to successfully repel the Axis forces. The scorched earth tactic utilized by the Soviets was to salt their fields so nothing would grow burn down bridges and destroy any factories or buildings they thought would be useful to the enemy's advance. This led to the complete destruction of Soviet lands, towns, and cities by their own hands, but kept the Axis soldiers from getting a foothold in their country. While Hitler had his forces split on two fronts, the Allies invaded Sicily from the Mediterranean and proceeded into southern Italy. There, they defeated the fascist Italian forces, causing the front to collapse, eventually leading to the capture and death of Benito Mussolini at the hands of the communist partisans. Then, on June 6, 1944, the beginning of the end of the war in Europe was put into motion when the D-Day invasion of Normandy was carried out. Allied forces now had troops in northern France, 
It was in 1944 that the tides of World War II changed. However, there was still a long way to go before victory would be declared. Before the final nail could be put in the Axis coffin, one vicious battle needed to take place. This came to be known as the Battle of the Bulge. Germany had one way out of defeat, and that was to break the Allied lines on one of the fronts. Hitler and the Nazi regime were being squeezed into smaller and smaller territory by the Soviets advancing from the east and the rest of the Allied forces advancing from the west. The remaining Axis forces were caught in the middle of a balloon that was about to pop. Hitler decided that the best course of action would be to try and break through the Western Front. If all went according to plan, he would split the Allied line, meaning he could maneuver his troops out of the predicament they were in. This would allow Germany a way to secure more resources and fend off the rest of the Allied forces advancing from the Western Front. On December 16, 1944, the Nazis launched their surprise attack through the Ardennes Forest in Belgium and Luxembourg. This offensive spanned around 80 miles and consisted of some of the fiercest fighting of the war. As the Nazi forces slammed into the Allied lines, they began to bulge, hence where the name came from. But they couldn't break through the enemy's lines. The Allies were able to repel the attack after attack carried out by the Axis tanks, soldiers, and the Luftwaffe. Unfortunately, the Nazis were not the only adversaries the Allies had to contend with. During the battle, the temperatures reached freezing conditions, leading to many soldiers developing frostbite and hypothermia. By the end of the battle, the Allies lost close to 75,000 men, but were able to hold the line. On the other hand, Germany lost between 80,000 and 100,000 men and were all but helpless against the advance of the Soviet army coming from the east. The Battle of the Bulge was the last chance for Germany to turn the tides of the war back in their favor, and they failed. The Soviets launched their winter offensive, which brought them within 50 miles of Berlin. It was at this point the war in Europe was just about over. There was no hope left for Germany and its allies in Europe. So, what actually ended World War II in Europe? Was it the death of Hitler? The answer to this question is no. The crazy thing is that there are two conflicting dates for the end of the Second World War on the European continent. It just depends on who you ask. Before the final surrender by Germany occurred, one final massacre took place. This came to be known as the firebombing of Dresden, which happened on February 13, 1945. This event killed thousands of civilians in one of the most horrific bombing campaigns of the entire war. The German lines were pushed further and further back toward Berlin as the weeks progressed. Hitler saw the end coming, and rather than being tried and sentenced for the atrocities he committed in his concentration camps and across Europe, he decided to take his own life like the coward that he was. This left the remaining leaders of the Nazi party to answer for what they'd done. The man with most of the decision-making power after Hitler's death was Grand Admiral Karl Donitz. On May 7, 1945, he started peace talks with the Allies, although Donitz seemed to have an ulterior motive besides just unconditional surrender. As the Soviet war machine marched toward Berlin, destroying everything in their path, Donitz hoped he could use the time until the peace talks to evacuate as many Germans out of the path of the Soviets as possible. To be fair, the Russians were brutal to any Nazi sympathizers they came across, as they would not soon forget the brutality their homeland faced as German troops marched across the country. Donitz also hoped that he could turn the US, British, and French against the Soviet Union, and perhaps even put the Allied powers at war with one another. However, all Donitz really accomplished was ordering General Alfred Jodl to sign the unconditional surrender of the Axis powers in Europe, effective the following day. At this point, the Allied forces ran into a problem. Joseph Stalin refused to accept the surrender by Jodl that was seen over by General Dwight D. Eisenhower and Rolls France. The rationale for this was threefold. The first reason was that since the Soviets had lost the most men of any Allied power, they should oversee the surrender. The second reason was that Stalin felt like the surrender should happen in the enemy capital of Berlin. And the third reason, and the most likely for why Stalin objected to the signing in France, was that there was no Soviet diplomat present at the peace talks. Therefore, Stalin had the Germans sign a second declaration of surrender in Karlshorst, which was a suburb of Berlin. It was there that Soviet Marshal Georgi Zhukov oversaw the surrender of the Germans. This happened on May 8th, but the Nazis asked for 12 hours to ensure that all of their troops received the order that there was to be a ceasefire and no unintentional conflicts broke out. The Soviets agreed, but only verbally. However, by the time everything was settled, it was May 9th. This resulted in two different dates for the end of World War II in Europe. The first was on May 8th, 1945, with the surrender in France under the watch of Eisenhower, and the second was in Berlin on May 9th, 1945, observed by Zhukov. So, if asked when World War II actually ended in Europe, the answer is a little tricky. It just depends on who you ask. 
Even though the fighting in Europe was over, there was still a war raging on in the Pacific. In that part of the world, Japan and the Allied forces battled on land, in the air, and at sea. Unfortunately, the end of this part of World War II would end in nuclear explosions, the destruction of entire cities, and the loss of unfathomable amounts of life. The war in the Pacific had a different start date than the one in Europe. On September 27, 1940, the Tripartite Pact was signed in Berlin by Germany, Italy, and Japan. This agreement stated that if any of the three nations were attacked by another nation not already in the war, the others would provide assistance. This alliance was used as a deterrent to keep the United States on the sidelines and out of the war. The Tripartite Pact also recognized that at the end of World War II, if the Axis powers were victorious, Germany would control Europe and the surrounding region, while Japan would be the rulers of East Asia and into the Pacific. Tensions between the United States and Japan had been growing since the US had imposed sanctions on Japan to slow its expansion and economic growth. Even though the Tripartite Pact was put into place to stop other countries from aiding the Allied powers, things went sideways with one event. A single decision by Japan would eventually lead to their downfall and the very end of World War II. Japan couldn't expect the rest of the world to take them seriously if they allowed the United States to slow their expansion goals. However, Japan also knew that if they went to war with the US, it was going to be a difficult fight to win. There was a chance that Japan could be victorious without much help from Germany and Italy, as long as they could use the element of surprise to destroy the United States Pacific Fleet in a single attack. They chose to do this through the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The Japanese knew that if they could catch the US Pacific Fleet at dock, they could use their bombers to destroy most of the ships. Unfortunately, not everything went as planned and several key vessels in the fleet, including all of its aircraft carriers, were out at sea. Unknown to Japanese intelligence, these ships had been delayed due to bad weather and would not be back at Pearl Harbor for several days. It was just a matter of dumb luck that the carriers were not back when the Japanese attacked. This event would also be one of the key factors that would lead to the end of World War II. There is no doubt that the attack on Pearl Harbor was a devastating blow to the US Navy, but the Japanese had failed to complete their main objective, the complete destruction of the Pacific Fleet. This, along with missing key targets such as fueling facilities and repair docks, allowed the United States to repair several ships, refuel the carriers, and launch a world of hurt on the Japanese forces in the Pacific. Pearl Harbor also caused the United States to join the Allies in Europe, which was one of the critical factors that allowed the Allies to eventually declare victory in that part of the world. Looking back at the war, Pearl Harbor might have been the decisive turning point that eventually led to the actual end of World War II. If Japan had not provoked the US to enter the war by bombing the fleet, Germany might have been able to win Europe. Japan would have also likely been able to hold their own in the Pacific. And once Germany and Italy controlled their region of the world, they could have provided more resources for Japan to conquer the rest of Asia and the South Pacific. However, the fact that the United States joined the World War II as a result of the attack on Pearl Harbor meant the Axis powers now had another powerful military to fight against. Japan now found itself in a desperate position. US forces were closing in on all sides. The final major battle in the Pacific Theater was the Battle of Okinawa. The United States planned to take the island of Okinawa and use it to launch bombing runs and an invasion force into the main island of Japan. On April 1, 1945, over 60,000 US soldiers landed on the beaches of Okinawa. They fought Japanese forces for almost three months before finally securing victory, but at a great cost. The island's dense forests and harsh volcanic landscape made securing it difficult. This also gave Japanese soldiers an advantage because they had the home ground advantage, which allowed them to set booby traps and ambush US soldiers. After the battle was over, the United States had lost around 12,000 men. 90,000 Japanese troops were killed in the battle as well. However, the most tragic part was that 100,000 civilians died as a result of the fighting between the Americans and Japanese for this strategic piece of land. After the loss of Okinawa, Japanese leaders knew their chance of winning the war in the Pacific was almost zero but they refused to give up and started preparing for the invasion of their island. However, the invasion would never come as what would happen next prompted the surrender of Japan and the official end of World War II in the Pacific. When US military strategists concluded an invasion of Japan would cost somewhere in the range of 1 million soldiers' lives, they decided to try a different way to end the war. The US brought in their newest and most deadly weapon yet, the atomic bomb. Only weeks after the first successful test of an atomic bomb on July 16, 1945 in Alamo Gordo, New Mexico, President Truman gave the go-ahead to use the destructive weapon on Japan. It was August 6 when the B-29 bomber named Enola Gay took off from the Mariana Islands. The bomber flew over mainland Japan and dropped the first atomic bomb as a way to destroy the manufacturing city of Hiroshima. 
However, due to its immense power, the explosion also killed somewhere between 70 and 120,000 people. This does not include the people who died later on from radiation poisoning and other complications due to the blast. When Japan did not surrender immediately, the boxcar was sent to drop a second atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Nagasaki. This bomb was actually more powerful than the first and killed somewhere between 50 and 80,000 people. The morality of dropping two atomic bombs on cities where the number of civilian casualties was known to be in the tens of thousands can be debated. Regardless, these two massacres did eventually lead to the surrender of Japan. One of the things that made this operation especially messed up was the fact that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were chosen as targets not because they had the most military significance, but because they hadn't been bombed extensively before. This was done to ensure the bombs did the most damage possible and optimize their efficiency. Unfortunately, as these cities were still pretty much intact and hadn't been bombed yet, there were still a lot of people living in them. Yes, this allowed the bombs to cause the destruction of military manufacturing facilities and eliminate enemy soldiers, but it also led to the deaths of countless innocent people as well. But something even crazier happened between the dropping of the first atomic bomb and the second one, an event that also contributed to the unconditional surrender of Japan that's not quite as well known. On August 8, 1945, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan and invaded Manchuria. This meant that not only were the Japanese soldiers being obliterated on the island in the Pacific, but the Red Army was marching their way through China and slaughtering any enemy soldiers they came across. Japan was already struggling to fend off the United States, and there was no way the country would succeed in also fighting the Soviets. The fact that Manchuria was on the mainland and many soldiers had already been brought back to Japan to fight off the imminent American invasion meant there was literally nothing Japan could do to hold their territories on the continent of Asia. Between the atomic bombs and the Soviet invasion, Emperor Hirohito of Japan announced that the country would be surrendering on August 15, 1945. It would take a couple of more weeks for word to spread and preparations to be made for the formal surrender of Japan and the official end of World War II in the Pacific. On September 2nd, General Douglas MacArthur formally acknowledged Japan's surrender, which was signed by Foreign Affairs Minister Mamoru Shigemitsu on board the U.S. Missouri. The battleship was anchored in Tokyo Bay and surrounded by over 250 Allied ships. From the start of World War II, when Hitler invaded Poland, to the surrender ceremony aboard the U.S. Missouri, a total of 2,194 days had passed. It was the bloodiest war the world had ever seen in its history. Japan's surrender marked the official end to World War II around the world. Now everyone could move on from the atrocities and devastation of the previous years. Or could they? The craziest part about how World War II actually ended was that for some, the war continued on, even after September 2nd. In the Philippines, there was a group of Japanese soldiers that refused to believe the war had ended. One man, named Hiro Onoda, was 23 years old when he was deployed to the Philippines to fight off the advancing American soldiers in 1944. He was in a squad with three other men, and all four of them believed that the reports of Japan surrendering were just propaganda to trick them into turning themselves over to the enemy. For years after the formal surrender of Japan, these men attacked Filipinos because they thought they were still fighting in World War II. This went on until about 1950, when one of the soldiers finally turned himself in and learned the truth about what had actually happened five years earlier. But Onoda and the other two soldiers refused to give up. It wasn't until 1972 that the Filipino police shot two of the Japanese soldiers, ending their delusions of fighting a war that ended 25 years earlier. This left Onoda as the only holdout left. In 1974, a Japanese tourist came into contact with Onoda and talked some sense into him. However, it wasn't until one of Onoda's former commanding officers came with a group of other military personnel that Onoda officially surrendered and returned home from the Philippines as a very confused retired soldier. He had been fighting World War II for almost 30 years after it had officially ended. And this wasn't just an isolated incident. Other Japanese soldiers who were spread out across the Pacific never received word that the war had ended. They continued to fight, not believing for a second that Japan would ever surrender, let alone lose the war. The last orders these soldiers were given was to fight until the bitter end no matter what. They were so devoted to the emperor that they would gladly lay down their lives for their country, and the thought of surrender never even crossed their minds. This just goes to show that the end of World War II did not happen at the same time for everyone. Tragically, some of the last people to be given their lives back after World War II were held captive by the United States. Although the war officially ended on September 2, 1945, Japanese internment camps in the United States did not close until March 1946. This was almost half a year after the Allies celebrated victory over Japan and the rest of the world received word that World War II was over. Yet, 120,000 people who were of Japanese heritage were still kept in internment camps long after the war was declared over.
For these people, World War II did not end in 1945. In fact, the last internment camp finally closed on March 20, 1946. And even after these innocent people were released from what can only be described as prison, they were often mistreated by other Americans for how they looked or where their family was from. It would be more apt to say that World War II for Japanese Americans did not end for several years or even decades after 1945, as they were still persecuted in many areas. This is the sad truth about what war does to people. During World War II, there was no population of people treated more horribly than the Jews. For many, the atrocities of the war would never be forgotten. World War II would be part of them for their entire lives as they suffered from PTSD and other afflictions caused by the Nazis and their allies. It's important to remember that even until this day, the horrors of World War II are ingrained in the psyches of many in the Jewish community. Even when the fighting stopped, there was still a long road to recovery for many people. United States soldiers who fought for years in the war did not actually get to experience the end of World War II for many months after the surrender of Japan. The soldiers wanted to return home now that the fighting was over. This wasn't an unreasonable request. However, many were required to stay abroad and oversee the transitions to new governments and to ensure that the peace treaties were enforced. Soldiers in the Pacific got so angry with being ignored by their representatives that they came up with the slogan, No Boats, No Votes. This would be written or stamped on letters sent back to the United States as a way to remind those in the government that if they weren't allowed to return home soon, there would be hell to pay in the next election cycle. Things got so bad that US soldiers started to hold protests against their own government. On Christmas Day in Manila, around 4,000 American soldiers held a mass demonstration to bring attention to their cause. They wanted to go home, and if the government wasn't going to bring them back, they were going to cause trouble. And this wasn't the only example of protests occurring. Demonstrations in London, Paris, and Frankfurt all carried the same battle cry. Some saw this as a form of mutiny. So the stranded soldiers had done their duty during World War II and risked their lives. It didn't seem like too much to ask to be brought home. The soldiers eventually did get back to the US, but many did not consider the war over until their boots were back on American soil. Officially, there are three different days that World War II ended. For many Europeans, the war was over on May 8th and is celebrated as Victory in Europe Day or VE Day. However, in Russia and Eastern Europe, some maintain that the official end of World War II happened on May 9th, when the Germans surrendered to the Soviets just outside of Berlin. For some countries in East Asia and the United States, the end of World War II didn't occur until September 2, 1945, when the Japanese officials signed the documents at the surrender ceremony aboard the US Missouri. This became known as Victory Over Japan Day or VJ Day. However, for many, World War II continued on even after the Axis powers surrender in Europe and Asia. A Cold War Between the United States and Germany, a Nazi flag on the moon, and an American Pacific Empire? These are some of the weirdest consequences of the United States staying out of World War II. By 1940, Europe and East Asia were aflame with war. Germany had launched a brutal assault against France, taking the country in mere weeks. A complete military disaster was only narrowly avoided thanks to the incredible efforts of the British in the Dunkirk evacuation, though Hitler's own incompetence played a large role in that too. With the Allied forces pinned against the sea, Hitler inexplicably ordered his panzers to stand down, relying on the Air Force to mop up the survivors and thus allowing their escape. But the Allies had lost their foothold in Europe and Britain was increasingly looking like the next target for Nazi invasion. Surviving World War I, German veterans beamed with pride at their conquest of Europe, even as Hitler turned his hungry eyes east toward the Soviet Union. In Asia, Japan had launched a brutal war against China. The small island nation desperately needed the manpower and raw natural resources of China to fuel its dreams of empire, and with complete military superiority, had led a devastating attack against the nationalist Kuomintang and the communists. They used chemical weapons with impunity, knowing the unsophisticated Chinese couldn't hope to respond with their own while they slaughtered civilians and POWs by the thousands. Despite a world in the grip of the most violent conflict in human history, the United States teetered on the brink of neutrality. Its citizens remembered all too well the brutality of World War I and the hundreds of thousands who had returned home with horrible wounds or not at all. The conflicts over there were a European and an Asian affair and had nothing to do with the United States. The hope to ensure peace between all mankind through the League of Nations had failed, and now Americans were more disillusioned than ever with the world. Why should they have to go fight other countries' wars when they could simply remain home safe and secure thanks to two big oceans and one of the best navies in the world? For Americans suffering through the Great Depression, there were simply bigger problems at home. Everyone else would have to solve their own this time. Isolationists in the US believed that the ongoing conflicts in Europe and Asia were the concerns of the nations involved and had nothing to do with the United States. 
Europe loves starting wars with itself, hosting a new major war every 20 years or so. Why would this be any different? The conquest of East Asia by the Japanese was unfortunate for those involved, but America and the rest of the Western powers had themselves long exploited the Chinese. In the minds of isolationists, the US could simply build up its military and remain neutral, working to ensure that no navy could challenge America in the Pacific or the Atlantic. The America First Committee and similar organizations all preached the message of isolationism and political neutrality, influencing the public through radio, print advertisement, and big rallies in large cities. Celebrities of the day such as Charles Lindbergh and popular radio priest Father Charles Coughlin spread the message of isolationism. Lindbergh even lashed out at President Roosevelt, who publicly claimed that the Nazis were a threat to democracy everywhere. Lindbergh would go on to say, These wars in Europe are not wars in which our civilization is defending itself against some Asiatic intruder. This is not a question of banding together to defend the white race against foreign invasion. Turns out Lindbergh was a white supremacist who also claimed that racial strength is vital. He even wrote a Reader's Digest article stating that our civilization depends on a western wall of race and arms which can hold back the infiltration of inferior blood. The America First Committee liked what it heard from Lindbergh, and soon its leader, Robert E. Wood, head of Sears Roebuck, invited Lindbergh to join the group and preach the good news about white supremacy and isolationism across the country. However, isolationist movements began to stumble thanks to Lindbergh himself. His previous glory and fame for feats in aviation had already tarnished significantly due to his blatant racism. But in a speech in Des Moines, Lindbergh announced it was time to name names. According to Lindbergh, the three most important groups who have been pressing this country toward war are the British, the Jewish, and the Roosevelt administration. Pressed on the matter, Lindbergh claimed that the Jews of all people should be fighting the hardest against the war, as in his eyes they would suffer the most. He then denounced the infiltration of the press, film industry, radio, and government by Jews. Lindbergh was immediately denounced as an anti-Semite. Interventionists, meanwhile, preached their own gospel. The US didn't just have a moral obligation to stand against Hitler, but a national defense obligation. If the democracies of West Europe fell to Hitler, then this critical line of defense against a powerful Germany would also fall and leave the US alone to face it in some future conflict. If France and Britain fell, Hitler would be in control of much of the world's oceans and the vast resources of the rest of the planet, as none would be able to oppose him. President Roosevelt described the situation as living at the point of a gun. Most interventionists believed that direct U.S. involvement was inevitable, but others called for a relaxation of the neutrality acts so the U.S. could instead equip Western powers with weapons and not have to do the fighting itself. William Allen White, chairman of the interventionist organization Committee to Defend America by Aiding the Allies, claimed that the best way to keep the U.S. out of war was to arm Britain. American opinion, however, was swiftly changing. In January of 1940, a public opinion poll showed that 88% of Americans opposed declaring war against the Axis powers. In June, only 35% of Americans believed they should even risk war by providing direct assistance to the Allies. However, France fell quickly after that, and Britain came under all-out assault, as the Royal Air Force heroically fought the superior German Luftwaffe off. As the battle for Britain began, 52% of Americans now believed that the US should risk war by aiding England. But as it became clear Britain was holding off the Germans from invading, public opinion swung even more in favor of joining the war. By April 1941, 68% of Americans favored going to war against the Axis. On December 7, 1941, the debate over America's entry into World War II ended. Congress declared war on Imperial Japan with a nearly unanimous vote. Only Montana's Jeanette Rankin, a pacifist and the first woman ever elected to Congress, voted against the war. Germany and Italy soon declared war against America, and history as we know it fell into place. But what if America had stayed out? The best way to tackle this question is to pose two different scenarios at the same time. In one scenario, the isolationists win the battle of public opinion, and the US remains completely neutral. This means no military assistance to Britain as well as no entry into the war. In the second scenario, the US continues providing assistance to Britain, and Russia doesn't join the fighting itself similar to how the United States is handling the Russian invasion of Ukraine today. In the first scenario, Germany's forces tighten the noose around Britain, cutting it off from overseas colonies shipping badly needed war goods into the island nation. Though Britain had the superior navy, the German navy made great use of U-boats to intercept British shipping. With shipyards in France and Norway under German control, and the vast resources of mainland Europe largely under its command, Germany is able to slowly outgun the British navy as the Royal Navy finds it more and more difficult to replenish combat losses. 
In the skies, the same scenario repeats. A big part of the reason the British Air Force was able to fend off the Luftwaffe is because it was receiving steady resupply from America. But forced to fight on its own means, the RAF slowly but surely begins to run out of oil, rubber for plane tires, and even ammunition. Eventually, it too is unable to replenish losses fast enough to keep up with the Luftwaffe. And by the end of 1941, if not sooner, Britain's air forces are all but defeated. Surviving planes are kept in reserve to respond to beachheads during a German invasion. With the Royal Navy similarly attritioned, Operation Sea Lion is at least realistically possible, and the fact that the British Isles are now a realistic military objective leads Hitler to not launch an invasion of the Soviet Union. At least not yet. Early in 1942 at the latest, German forces make landfall on Britain, and Britain begins a desperate but ultimately losing war of survival. But what if the US had stayed out of the war but continued to provide critical supplies to Britain? This phase of the war would have remained largely the same, though losses in manpower are harder for Britain to replenish than war materials. Ultimately, an invasion of the British homelands is delayed, but not indefinitely, and an invasion by 1943 is very likely. Hitler does run the risk of bringing the United States into the war regardless, but he may have taken a cue from history and learned from Germany's past mistakes. This would mean that he wouldn't approve the unrestricted submarine warfare that pushed the US into joining World War I. Instead, Hitler shows patience as his air force and navy slowly but surely reduce Britain's available manpower. In the end, Hitler still invades Britain, and without US forces to help, the island nation falls. In Africa, Hitler's superior forces cut off the British from the Middle Eastern oil early in the war. Without US reinforcements, Britain is forced to stand alone against Rommel's desert armies, to disastrous effect. While they put up a spirited defense, inevitably superior German resources trump British resistance, and now Germany is left with its hand on the global oil supply. This causes a great deal of concern within the United States, but the US can be self-sufficient if it needs to, thanks to its own vast oil reserves. However, Hitler is now the most politically powerful leader in history, thanks to his ability to control the flow of Middle Eastern oil. This victory ensures the German war machine can run unopposed indefinitely, completely overwhelming any would-be adversary. In Eastern Europe, Hitler eventually breaks his cooperation pact with Stalin, but at a later date than happened in our timeline. This is due to his need to mop up British resistance on the home islands, but with Prince Edward as a puppet monarch on the British throne, Hitler effectively controls most of Britain a year after the invasion. He can now divert the bulk of his military to the Eastern Theater in anticipation of a massive assault against the Soviet Union. What happens next depends on if the United States remain neutral or simply refuse to join the war. If the US remains neutral, then it never sends vast amounts of military and humanitarian aid to the Soviet Union as Germany begins Operation Barbarossa. America's assistance to the Soviets is an often overlooked factor in determining what would have happened if the US never entered the war. The United States was in fact one of the main reasons the Soviets were able to mount an effective resistance to the invasion in the first place, as the US sent a whopping $180 billion in today's money to the USSR over a period of four years. By comparison, the US has so far pledged only about $15 billion in total assistance to Ukraine today. The aid the US provided included 400,000 jeeps and trucks, 14,000 airplanes, 8,000 tractors, 13,000 tanks, 1.5 million blankets, 15 million pairs of army boots, 107,000 tons of cotton, 2.7 million tons of petrol products, and 4.5 million tons of food. At one point, nearly every truck the Soviets operated was American, and nearly every Soviet soldier was clothed thanks to America. Without this significant amount of aid, even vast Soviet industrial might would not be able to stand against Germany's onslaught for long especially if forces left to fend off an allied assault from Britain were no longer necessary due to the island's pacification. Stalin's military, atrophied by his vast political purges, absolutely crumples in the face of German assault, and both its soldiers and population starve without American aid shipments. Without hundreds of thousands of American trucks and vehicles, the Soviet war machine has to rely on horse-drawn carts and marching on foot while German mechanized forces outrun and outmaneuver ever-retreating Soviet armies. Eastern Europe turns to a bloodbath for the communists, and within months Moscow has fallen and Stalin and his government flee to the Far East. Germany does not pursue, as there's no need. It's taken exactly what it wanted from the Soviet Union, the fertile and resource-rich southwest of the nation. The Soviet Union continues to exist as a puppet state, but things get worse for them due to the crushing defeat in Eastern Europe. Japan reignites the Russo-Japanese War and takes vast swaths of Russian-held territory in the Far East for itself. After another year of fighting, Russia no longer has a presence in Asia, and Japan is left in complete control of the continent. If America continued to supply the Soviets, the fighting would have dragged on for far longer, but defeat was inevitable, 
With no need to secure France against invasion, Germany can free up hundreds of thousands of troops to throw into the meat grinder that is Eastern Europe. Eventually, the result is the same, and both Japan and Germany push the Soviets out of their respective sphere of power and reduce the USSR to client state status. Stalin vows never ending the war, but he's hunted down by German assassins and a fascist Russian ruler is installed by the Germans. In Asia, though, our what-if scenario gets even more interesting. Japan's attack on the United States is what precipitated the nation joining World War II. But if the United States had remained truly neutral, Japan may not have attacked at all. The attack on Pearl Harbor was premeditated by the United States stopping shipments of oil and rubber to Japan, seriously harming its plans for Asian conquest. Japan now had only a few months worth of supply, with necessitated war against the United States and the seizing of oil-rich European colonies in the South Pacific. But if the United States had remained completely neutral, there's a chance war would have been averted for now. With the US still supplying Japan with oil, rubber, and other heavy industry resources, Japan is free to continue consolidating its gains in China. Within a few years, most of China becomes Japan's manufacturing base, skyrocketing the power of the Pacific Empire. This allows them to push Russian forces out of the region completely and begin the systematic conquest of remaining smaller Asian nations. But the Philippines and other small holdings in Southeast Asia remain under US control. Australia becomes the perfect base of operations to counter Japan's growing power in Asia. In order to prevent Japanese hedge money in the South Pacific, the United States now moves significant forces to Australia, Guam, and the Philippines, drawing a red line in the sand to Japanese expansionism. This is a situation the Japanese can ill abide as it places U.S. forces within striking range of the most vital trade arteries for the Japanese Empire and makes it possible for the U.S. Navy to slowly choke Japan to death. Inevitably, war between Japan and the United States breaks out. During World War II, the U.S. had a Europe-first policy and sent the bulk of its combat power to Europe. However, in this alternate timeline, America is free to use the bulk of its military against Japan. With Europe falling to the Germans, the U.S. pulled itself out of the Great Depression thanks to the largest rearmament effort in human history dwarfing even that of the Germans prior to the Second World War. Japan, meanwhile, had not had the time to set up much-needed industry infrastructure in China or hold on to it against Chinese partisans. The US absolutely dwarfs Japan's military in the Pacific, and Japan is left with no choice but to call for help from its European ally, Germany. Now Hitler faces a tough choice. He can declare war against America to relieve pressure on Japan, but it'll be years before his forces can do much to actually threaten the US. Building a navy capable of crossing the Atlantic and delivering troops to North America takes time, and Hitler has plenty of reasons to not bother as he sets about building his glorious Third Reich. Further, thanks to Hitler's paranoia, he split up the scientists working on a nuclear bomb amongst several independent laboratories, severely slowing down Nazi Germany's nuclear weapons program. With most of Europe's intellectuals taking refuge in America, the United States now has the greatest concentration of engineers and scientists in the world and has already produced several nuclear bombs and is well on its way to building planes capable of reaching Europe from America. Hitler can instead opt to break his alliance with Japan and declare a cooperation pact with the United States instead. This will give Germany time to rebuild from its war of conquests and consolidate its hold over Europe and the Middle East. Racially motivated, Hitler has more in common with white Americans than with the Japanese anyway, whom he sees as intrinsically inferior on the genetic level. If America had remained truly neutral up to this point, it's possible that such a cooperation pact does in fact take place. Such neutrality would have necessitated that President Roosevelt not win re-election and instead a much more isolationist and pro-German president take his place. In this timeline, Germany has no reason to be in competition with America, and instead, as trade relations open up in the post-war environment, the two might become fast friends. This frees up the US to crush the Japanese Empire in the Pacific War and ultimately declare hegemony over East Asia. The world is now ruled by two equal military powers, the German Third Reich in Europe and the Middle East and the United States of America in the Western Hemisphere and East Asia. The two sides are ideologically opposed, fascism versus democracy. But after their respective costly wars, have little reason to fight each other. Plus, simple logistics make such a war unlikely. One side or the other would have to ultimately cross the Atlantic and land troops on the other's territory, an impossible proposition without nearby staging points for an invasion. Hitler's racial purges drive millions of refugees into the Western Hemisphere, and the best and brightest amongst them bolster the American economy and industry. The United States quickly becomes the brains of the world. And in the decades that come, its scientific, industrial, and military edge over Nazi Germany grows exponentially. Meanwhile, Hitler's racially pure Third Reich stagnates from a lack of diversity and innovation. 
His fascist oppressive rule has caused the world's best artists, engineers, and scientists to flee to the democratic USA. The brain drain cripples the Third Reich's ability to compete internationally against the growing might of America, leaving an aging Hitler with only one choice if he wishes to ever topple the threat that a much more powerful United States of America now poses – complete and total nuclear war. World War II has come to a close. The Nazis are victorious, yet their reign of destruction and terror is not over. The Nazis have secret plans to eradicate religion, revive long-extinct species, and eventually conquer the entire world. One of the weirdest plans the Nazis had in store for after World War II was bringing back extinct species. Nazi scientists were doing all kinds of crazy experiments. They were also committing countless crimes against humanity, which would obviously be a key aspect of their post-war plans as well. But the Nazis had been working on some pretty wild ideas that were not based around mass genocide. One such experiment was to bring an ancient giant cow back from extinction. The Nazis had bioengineers working on a way to bring back a variety of extinct species. One of the organisms they hoped to return to Earth was the auroch. This was an ancient cow that could weigh over 3,000 pounds. That's about 1,000 pounds heavier than the average cow today. Just think about how much steak that would be. The Nazis may have been trying to bring back the auroch as a food source that would feed their growing Aryan population. However, the Nazis were conducting all kinds of crazy experiments, so bringing back long extinct species may have had a more sinister purpose than just creating a viable food source. We're not saying the Nazis were trying to bring back a T-Rex to fight on their side, but we wouldn't put it past them either. In reality, the Nazis did not win World War II, but if they had, things would be very different. If they secured victory and were allowed to carry out their post-war secret plans, you probably wouldn't be here right now. This is because, like most people, you're probably not 100% Aryan. But how would this nightmare scenario of a Nazi-run world have even been possible? In 1940, a Nazi victory looked like a real possibility. The British government even discussed making peace with Germany as the Nazi war machine swept across Europe. But Hitler made a series of mistakes that would eventually lead to his downfall. The decision to invade the Soviet Union and fight a war on multiple fronts was eventually the Nazis' undoing. Their forces were spread too thin. And once the United States joined the war, the Allies had the men and resources needed to push back the Germans. If Hitler had maintained his focus on Europe and kept the United States out of the war, the Nazis could have won and set their next plans into motion. But what would the Nazis have done with their newfound power? And what horrors awaited the rest of the world? Once the Nazis conquered Western Europe and Britain, they would begin to set up a defensive border on the east. Then, the first series of post-war plans could begin. The Nazis would start by annexing the lands in the surrounding region. This would mostly consist of Nordic territories, which contained peoples who the Nazis considered suitable to add to their Aryan Empire. The rest of the world would slowly be divided up among the Nazi allies for the time being. It's likely that the Nazis would claim half of the Soviet Union as their own for its resources and forced labor, while the rest of the massive country was given to Japan. Hitler had plans for the rest of the world, but first he would need to take inventory of his spoils. Once lands had been consolidated between the Nazis and their allies, it would be time for the next war. In fact, if the Nazis had won World War II, their plan was to never actually stop fighting. They would control the entire world or die trying. Regardless of whether these Nazi intentions were supposed to be secret or not, the whole world knew that if Germany was victorious in World War II, it was only a matter of time until they started their next campaign. Hitler and the Nazis were never going to be happy with just conquering Europe. Basically, the plan was that once the land was divided up amongst the Axis powers, there would be a momentary peace, but it wouldn't last forever. East Asia would still need to be completely subdued, and although Japan was mainly responsible for this operation, the Nazis knew that they would eventually need to send forces deeper into Asia. There was also the continent of Africa, which contained resources that the new Nazi empire would need to sustain itself. Many of the Afrikaners of South Africa may have been easily persuaded to join the Nazi ranks as they already held deeply racist beliefs about the indigenous peoples of the region. This would give the Nazis a foothold in southern Africa, which they could use to their advantage. And since at that point the armies of Britain and other colonial powers in Africa would have already been defeated, all the Nazis had to do was send in military forces to squash any remaining resistance and subjugate the people of the continent. Unfortunately, if the Nazis had been victorious, this plan may have culminated in the people of Africa being forced into slavery or annihilated by the new rulers since they did not meet the requirements of the Aryan race. As the post-war plans of the Nazis unfolded, there would be one main force of resistance left to deal with – the United States. 
During the war, Hitler was extremely vocal about his doubtfulness that the United States would last as a nation. He saw the country as teetering on the edge of chaos. Due to its mix of ethnicities and cultures, Hitler believed the country would implode in on itself. Hitler firmly held the idea that there could be no peace between the different races and that his hierarchy with Aryans at the top was the only way humanity could exist. Obviously, this isn't true. But Hitler's plan was to make peace with the US and just wait patiently for the country to descend into chaos. If that didn't happen by the time Nazis had conquered the rest of the world, Hitler was more than happy to send forces to the Americas and invade the United States. This couldn't happen until he controlled the resources of Europe, Asia, and Africa. But in the Nazi post-war plan, it was only a matter of time until they controlled these continents. Although the fact that the United States had already developed aircraft with powerful bombing capabilities as well as the nuclear bomb may have forced the Nazis to deal with the US threat sooner rather than later. And this brings us to the part of the secret post-war plan that wasn't much of a secret. If the Nazis had won the war, they would have continued their genocidal acts against the Jewish people and anyone else who did not fit their Aryan mold. One of the main goals for the post-war Nazi empire was to completely eradicate the Jewish population from the face of the earth. However, they didn't want to just stop there. The Nazis would have continued rounding up and killing any peoples who would not further the Aryan race, which pretty much consisted of everyone who lived outside of Europe. This probably made their Japanese allies a little wary. If the Nazis did win, it was only a matter of time before they came to wipe out the Asian people and replace them with Aryans. Which brings us to one of the craziest secret plans the Nazis had for after the war. Even as the battles of World War II were raging on, the Nazis created the Liebensborn Baby Factories. These were basically facilities where babies of Aryan parents would be born and raised. This was done to make sure there was a constant supply of Aryan children to join the ranks of the Nazis and conquer the world. The Liebensborn programs did not just breed Aryan babies in captivity, however, it also stole babies from other countries. It's estimated that around 100,000 children were stolen from Polish families during the war and put in the Nazi facilities. Nazi soldiers were also encouraged to find and mate with European women who had Aryan characteristics. This happened with or without the woman's consent. After the war, the Nazis would need to ramp up the program to repopulate the world as they continued to commit mass genocide wherever they went. But stealing babies could only get the Lebensborn program so far. During the war, there was a major obstacle in Hitler's way to creating his master race, the Christian Church. Hitler and other leaders of the Nazi party wanted to dismantle Christianity, and there were a few reasons for this. But one of the main ones was they needed to create a large Aryan population quickly. In the monogamous relationships that people who belonged to the Catholic and Protestant faiths engaged in, ramping up population growth was difficult. Hitler encouraged Nazi men to be polygamous. In fact, after the war, the Nazis were planning on imposing a state policy that required Nazi men to impregnate as many women as possible to keep the population growing. In order for this new state-sanctioned polygamy to be taken seriously, the Nazis needed to get rid of the Christian church. And that was not the only reason why post-war Germany wanted to dismantle this religious institution. The morality of what the Nazis were doing was questioned by the heads of the church. Getting into heaven if you were engaged in mass genocide was just not something many Christian leaders were willing to get behind. Therefore, the principles of the Nazi party and the church could not be reconciled. Since the conflict with the church was inevitable, the Nazis planned to get rid of it altogether. Hitler youth were indoctrinated to the belief that the National Socialist movement and the church could not coexist, and so one of them had to go. And if the Nazis had won World War II, their plan was to eradicate the Christian religion. The secret plan was actually sped up slightly when in 1943 the Vatican spoke out against Hitler and the Nazis and the atrocities they were committing. The Nazis tried to sneak into the Vatican City to assassinate the Pope but did not succeed. Someone tipped off the Vatican officials and the Pope was snuck out before he could be kidnapped or eliminated. If the Nazis had won World War II, the fate of the Catholic Church would have not been pleasant. In fact, the Nazi post-war plan was to get rid of all organized religion and make the state the only thing people believed in. Hitler and the Nazi leadership planned to put themselves on a pedestal comparable to God, and everyone in their new empire would be required to worship and devote their lives to them. Nazi plans after World War II started with regrouping their force and then removing any further opposition to them in Europe. This included the Christian religion. Then the Nazis would sweep across the rest of the world, eliminating or subjugating other ethnicities. The end goal, which wasn't much of a secret, was to create a world where the Aryan race ruled and made up the majority of the population. That being said, even if the Nazis had won World War II and carried out their crazy secret plans for world domination, they may have been destroyed by an unseen force. The breeding of genetically similar people to create more genetically similar people can lead to problems. One example of this can actually be seen in the descendants of the Afrikaner population today. 
This population tends to have a higher percentage of individuals with Huntington's disease than the rest of the world. This is due to a relatively small group of people reproducing with one another without introducing much variation into the gene pool. A similar thing might have happened as a result of the Nazis' plans to create a population of Aryans to spread across the world. The lack of genetic diversity could have led to higher rates of mutations and disease. So this part of the Nazi secret plans for after World War II may have actually ended up being their downfall. August 1942 German forces push deep into the Soviet Union, seeking to pierce its political heart before the brutal winter sets in. However, just north of Stalingrad, the Soviets fight four brutal battles to slow the advance of the German Wehrmacht. Collectively known as the Kotluban operations, these pitched battles are some of the fiercest of World War II, and the Soviets take 200,000 casualties, a staggering figure. The German assault, however, is sufficiently slowed and allows the Red Army to prepare the ideologically important city of Stalingrad for defense. In preparation for the coming siege, the Soviet High Command ships hundreds of tons of cattle and grain across the Volga River. However, Stalin refuses to evacuate a single person of the 400,000 civilians left in the city. This cold calculus has one single purpose. With civilians still in the city, Stalin believes it will inspire the Red Army to fight all the harder in defense of the city. Plus, many of these civilians can be rounded up and forced to fight as partisans if required. It's a brutal move, made even more punishing by the fact that Stalin's harvest victory, as his shipping of food out of the city is known, leaves Stalingrad short of food for its nearly half a million population. As the German forces move closer, the civilian population is pressed into service to build trenches and other defensive fortifications. Nobody's under any illusion that the siege that's coming will be an easy one and the entire city is preparing for some of the bloodiest fighting of the Second World War. The Germans punctuate the point by softening up the city with a massive aerial bombardment starting on August 23rd and continuing until the end of the month. The German bombing turns the city into a massive funeral pyre and thousands die or are severely wounded. After the 25th of August, the Soviets simply stop collecting data on casualties as there are so many. The Soviet Air Force rises to meet the German bombers, but fighter escorts tear into them. German pilots are better trained and more experienced after the failed Battle of Britain, and the Soviet Air Force suffers 201 aircraft losses by the end of the month. By August 31st, the Soviet Air Force has only 192 aircraft left, 57 of which are fighters. The Luftwaffe completely owns the skies over Stalingrad. The German 6th Army is the first to feel the teeth of Soviet defenses. Short on tanks and anti-tank guns, the Soviets are instead pressing anti-aircraft guns into service to fend off the German tanks. The 1077th Anti-Aircraft Regiment is staffed mostly of young female volunteers who have little if any training in engaging ground targets. The women show incredible bravery despite their lack of experience, and the Germans are forced to destroy or overrun every single one of the 37 anti-aircraft guns, after which they find to their surprise that they are all manned by women. Enemy infantry is being met by workers' militias organized by the NKVD. These civilian units have no training and are often sent to battle with no weapons. They are cannon fodder in every sense of the word. The Russian callous disregard for human life is apparent, as hundreds of unarmed civilians are mowed down by German defenders. Any who try to retreat or run away are shot in the back by their NKVD commanders. The militias are slaughtered in scores but succeed in eating up German ammunition in time, slowing the advance and softening them up for Red Army units. Inside of the city itself, factories churn out tanks even throughout the fighting. There's no time to paint or even equip these tanks with gun sights, and they're literally driven by their crews from the factory floor straight to the front line. Without even primitive gun sights, these tanks are forced to fight at practically point-blank range. As August comes to a close, Army Group South B reaches the Volga north of Stalingrad. The Soviets are pinched off as German units also advance south of the city along the river, forcing them to abandon defensive positions outside of the city for the inner defensive ring inside of it. By the end of the month, the Germans have completely enveloped Stalingrad on three sides. September 1942 Bridges across the Volga have been destroyed by the German Luftwaffe, and with the Germans closing access to the city off from north, south, and east, the only way to resupply Soviet forces is by crossing the river in boats and barges pulled by tugs. However, this is incredibly dangerous, as German artillery is well within range of the river, and German air patrols descend on any attempt to cross the river. Many Soviet civilians and soldiers both die attempting to cross the river, and yet the efforts continue mostly at night, as the defenders inside are desperately needing weapons, ammunition, and food. On September 5th, the Soviets attempt to counterattack and help lift the siege on the city. The Soviet 24th and 66th Armies rally for an attack against the 14 Panzer Corps, 
However, the Germans have air superiority and advance warning of the attack, and the Luftwaffe decimates the Soviets' artillery. Without their artillery support, the Soviets are forced to withdraw after only a few hours of fighting. They lose one quarter of their 120 tanks in the fighting, with minimal losses on the German side. Stalin's Order No. 227 has made it punishable by military tribunal to retreat from the enemy. Thus, Soviet commanders refuse to order retreats even in the face of certain defeat. This has turned Stalingrad into an absolute meat grinder of inhuman proportions, as badly outgunned and outnumbered Soviet units are destroyed to the man. However, a refusal to retreat has also severely slowed the German advance, and by the time fighting reaches into the city in mid-September, the Germans are now fighting block to block. On the 14th of September, the Germans launch a three-prong attack into the city, hoping to overwhelm the defenders with a speedy maneuver. The 51st Army Corps 295th Infantry Division advances on the strategically important Mameyev Kurgan Hill, high ground which gives whoever holds it command over large parts of the city. The 71st Infantry Division attacks on the Central Rail Station and the main landing stage on the Volga River, where the Soviets are receiving a steady trickle of supplies and reinforcements from across the river. The 48th Panzer Corps is sent to attack south of the Tsaritsa River to help pin down the Soviet defenders. The attacks initially go to plan, with the Soviet 13th Guards Rifle Division suffering very high losses in a counterattack in the Mameyev Kurgan and Rail Station No. 1. In just one day, it loses 30% of its soldiers in fierce fighting. Only 320 of the original 10,000 men who make up the 13th Guards Rifle Division will survive the battle. They succeed, however, in retaking both objectives at least temporarily, with both objectives changing hands multiple times. The railway station changes hands an incredible 14 times in just 6 hours. The fight is so brutal that by the evening of the second day of fighting, the 13th Guards Rifle Division now exists only on paper. In the south of the city, 50 Soviet soldiers make a last stand at a huge grain elevator. They're surrounded and cut off from all resupply, but continue to fight for 5 days. They fight off 10 assaults by German forces before running out of ammunition and water. To deny the enemy valuable grain, they set fire to it before retreating. As the Germans sift through the wreckage of the fighting, they're shocked to discover only 40 enemies dead. They believed that due to the intensity of the resistance, they were up against a much larger unit. Elsewhere in the city, Soviet Sergeant Yakov Pavlov commands his unit to fortify the ruins of a four-story building with a commanding view. The building is strategically important, and the Germans attempt to take it with assault after assault. However, the Soviets have surrounded the fortified building with minefields and are defending it with well-entrenched machine gun nests. Incredibly, Pavlov will hold the building for two months with few reinforcements and earn the Hero of the Soviet Union award for his efforts. The fighting rages through the month of September, with the Germans making slow incremental progress. However, by the end of the month, they've failed to secure the all-important Volga River crossings. Without achieving these objectives, the Soviets are able to continue pouring reinforcements and resupply to the beleaguered defenders, even under assault from German artillery and aircraft both. October 1942 With the Luftwaffe unable to stop the Soviet reinforcements over the Volga, and with German ground forces stuck in bitter house-to-house -house fighting, the battle for the city has turned into a fight for meters. Success is measured in number of buildings taken or defended, and the fighting has devolved into a brutal close-quarters combat. The Soviets are creating defensive positions in apartment blocks, houses, factories, and warehouses, defending them with small groups of 5 to 10 men. This allows them to spread out across the city, with other defenders immediately searching to retake a lost position. It's an insane game of whack-a-mole, and the Germans call it Rattenkrieg or Rat War. In the taller buildings, German and Soviet soldiers fight each other off on different floors, firing up or down at one another through holes in the floors and ceilings. Soviet defenders fight suicidally, as once they're pushed to the topmost floor, there's nowhere left to retreat. They're fighting on what Sun Tzu once called death ground, a position where only options are victory or death, and thus are fighting fiercely for every single floor. Superior German firepower is useless in these close quarters battles, and Soviet commanders are taking full advantage of the urban terrain. They order units to hug German forces so as to deny them the use of artillery or close air support. The Germans are still better equipped, and the tactic costs the Soviets dearly but it is staggeringly effective. With the Russians having little regard for the lives of the men they sent into the fighting, they're stopping the German offensive with a literal tsunami of human bodies. On October 14th, the Germans launched the greatest offensive of the Stalingrad campaign. Within eyesight of the Red October Steel Factory, the Barricadi Arms Factory, and the Stalingrad Tractor Factory, all of which are running around the clock despite air and artillery attack, the Germans launch an attack 
using the 15th Panzer 24th Panzer Division and 305th Infantry Divisions. By the afternoon, the Germans have inflicted heavy casualties on the 37th Guards Rifle Division and pushed past the tractor factory to arrive at the Volga. The Soviets immediately respond by sending three battalions from the 300th Rifle Division and the 45th Rifle Division to lift the siege on the Red October Steel Factory. The Germans will hold two of their objectives but ultimately fail to expel the Soviets fully from the Baderkanti Arms Factory. November 1942 The Germans control 90% of the city and have reached the Volga. However, by now ice flows make resupply across the river impossible, though the advance has split Soviet forces in two completely surrounded pockets. However, the Germans have focused so completely on taking Stalingrad that they have neglected to secure their flanks outside the city. These flanks are being defended by Hungarian, Italian, and other client state forces who are nowhere near as well equipped or trained as the Germans. They are also severely lacking anti-tank weapons. The Germans have failed to secure the natural line of defense, the Don River outside the city, and what defenders are there are spread dangerously thin across a wide front. This is not lost on Soviet high command and on November 19th they launch Operation Uranus, a massive attack on the northern flank launched with three complete armies consisting of the 1st Guards Army, 5th Tank Army and 21st Army, consisting of a total of 18 infantry divisions, 8 tank brigades, 2 motorized brigades, 6 cavalry divisions and 1 anti-tank brigade. The Romanians have been capturing radio intercepts of the pending attack for days, but the request for reinforcements go completely ignored. In short order, the Romanian 3rd Army is completely overrun and Soviet forces penetrate deep into the German rear areas. Incredibly, the Germans have taken no steps to secure their rear, and the Soviets are able to push far south. Bad weather grounds the Luftwaffe, which is unable to conduct air operations to help repel the assault. On the 20th of November, Soviet forces launch a second offensive south of Stalingrad against the Romanian 4th Army Corps. These Romanian forces are largely made up of infantry and lack anti-tank weapons, thus they are easily routed by Soviet tank forces. Three days later, on November 23rd, Soviet forces from the northern and southern attacks meet at the town of Kalach, effectively trapping the German 6th Army and supporting forces inside Stalingrad. In total, 265,000 enemy forces have been trapped inside Stalingrad the city they had fought so hard to take. Like a mouse straining for cheese on a trap, the Germans are now stuck. On November 24th, Field Marshal Erich von Manstein implores Hitler not to order the 6th Army to break out of its encirclement and abandon Stalingrad. Hermann Göring, head of the Luftwaffe, also assures Hitler that he'll be able to keep the 6th Army resupplied via airdrops. The two convince Hitler and seal the fate of the 6th Army. December 1942 Incredibly, Hitler orders that Army Group A continue its progress invading the Caucasus south of Stalingrad, rather than redirect to help lift the envelopment of the 6th Army. Hitler still believes that another relief force can be assembled and that the Luftwaffe can keep the 6th Army resupplied. However, the trapped Germans require 700 tons of supplies a day, and the Luftwaffe is hard-pressed to deliver an average of 106 tons a day. It soon becomes clear to Monstein that this is a completely untenable situation and he implores Hitler to enact a plan for the 6th Army to break out, reversing his earlier position. The Soviets, meanwhile, launch attacks on the airfields being used to land supplies. On December 23rd, the Soviet 24th Tank Corps push into Skasirskaya, deep behind German lines, in order to neutralize nearby airfields. On the morning of the 24th, Soviet tanks reach Tatsinskaya and destroy many German planes there. Now the Germans are forced to move their resupply efforts to an airfield 190 miles from Stalingrad, adding even more time and difficulties to the air resupply operations. Nonetheless, the resupply attempts continue and soon begin to dwindle due to ongoing losses of aircraft and crew. Soviet anti-air guns and fighters alike take a heavy toll on German aircraft trying to land supplies to the beleaguered 6th Army. 165 transport aircraft are destroyed and 328 heavily damaged beyond repair. 266 Junkers Ju-52s are destroyed along with 42 Ju-86s, 9 FW-200 Condors, 5 HE-177 Bombers, and 1 Ju-290. 1,000 pilots and aircrew are lost in the attempts to keep the 6th Army inside Stalingrad resupplied. On the ground, the German Army launches Operation Winter Storm, an offensive to try and break through to the 6th Army. Hitler is signed off on the attack but insisted that the 6th Army try not to reach the advancing German forces by launching its own breakout attack in their direction. Instead, he insists that the 6th Army remain in place, believing them to be a critical cornerstone on the River Volga. By the 19th of December, German forces are within 30 miles of the 6th Army, 
and some officers insist that Hitler's orders be defied and the 6th Army break out from its position to link up with German forces. Those requests go ignored, however. The Soviets, however, launched their own attack on the 16th of December aimed at punching through the mostly Italian contingent of the Axis Army on the Don. The Italians fight surprisingly well, a rarity in this war. But ultimately, three days later, they can no longer hold off the advancing Soviets. With the entire relief effort collapsing, Manstein pleads with Hitler to order the 6th Army to break out, but Hitler refuses. It's just as well, as by now the 6th Army doesn't have the fuel necessary to attempt a breakout, and doing so on foot in winter conditions would have likely end it in disaster. German forces now shift from attempting to link up with the Stalingrad pocket to defending against brutal Soviet counterattacks. January 1943 on the 7th of January, the Red Army High Command sends three envoys into the city with terms of surrender. The Soviets deliver terms to German Field Marshal Friedrich Paulus. The terms are very generous. If he agrees to surrender within 24 hours, all prisoners would be guaranteed safe, humane treatment with medical care given to all injured or sick. Prisoners would also be given proper food rations and allowed to keep personal belongings. Further, after the war, they'd be allowed to repatriate to any country of their choice. Paulus contacts Hitler and asks for permission to surrender. Hitler, however, flat out rejects it. The 6th Army may no longer be an effective fighting force, its men starving with barely any ammunition left, but they are tying up a significant number of Russian forces. The Germans retreat into the Stalingrad suburbs, losing the vital airfields at Potomnik and Gumrak. This means resupply and air evacuation of the wounded is only possible at the Stalingradskaya Flight School, but landings end there on the 23rd of January. Only intermittent airdrops of supplies will continue from this moment on. The 6th Army has been all but completely abandoned. Bloody urban combat ensues, with the Soviets steadily pushing the Germans back toward the Volga River. The Germans refuse to surrender, believing the Soviets will simply kill any prisoners taken. Some Soviet citizens, unhappy with Stalin's regime, have joined the Germans and they fight like caged animals, knowing that they will for sure be killed if captured. On the 22nd of January, Paulus is once again given terms of surrender. He contacts Hitler and informs him that he can no longer command his men as they have no more ammunition or food. Hitler, however, once more denies him the opportunity to surrender and instead orders that he and his men stand fast to the last soldier and the last bullet. He promises Paulus that he and his men have made a historic contribution to one of the greatest struggles in German history and will be remembered as heroes. On January 26th, German forces have been completely split by a Soviet thrust into two pockets. The northern pocket consists of the 8th Corps and the 11th Corps, and they're cut off from communication with Paulus by Soviet forces. Two days later, the defensive pockets are once more split, this time into three parts, with the northern pocket containing the 11th Corps the Central Pocket, the 8th and the 51st Corps, and the Southern Pocket, the 14th Panzer Corps and the 4th Corps. The Germans now have 40,000 to 50,000 sick and wounded. On January 30th, in response to Paulus's notification that the entire army will likely collapse by the end of the day, Hitler issues field promotions to several officers in the 6th Army. He promotes Paulus to General Field Marshal and reminds Paulus that no German or Prussian Field Marshal has ever surrendered in combat. This comes with the implication that if Paulus surrenders, he will be shaming himself for eternity. The next day, the southern pocket collapses, and Soviet forces take German headquarters, capturing Paulus who claims that he was taken by surprise. He refuses to issue an order for the northern pocket to surrender. The central pocket surrenders a few hours later. February 1943 On February 2nd, the northern pocket officially surrenders to the Soviets. An estimated 91,000 German prisoners of war are captured, many of them wounded, sick, or starving. Few of them will survive brutal Soviet POW camps and make it back home to Germany after the war. Day 1 Colonel Chad Hogan of the U.S. Army imagines there's no place on Earth worse than the POW camp he's currently being held in the Philippines. It's early 1944. He was captured in 43. Right now, he has no idea that the camp in the Philippines is a better place to be than the camp he's getting transferred to. At this very moment, he's standing in a line made up of mostly U.S. POWs about to board a ship that's part of a fleet they've nicknamed the Hell Ships. Day 2. Hogan is on the ship. He and the other men haven't been fed, but it could be much worse. He thinks back to the 66-mile march he and the other prisoners were forced to go on under the hot Philippine sun. Many of his friends died or collapsed from exhaustion during this hike from Hell. Hogan's sitting next to another prisoner, a captain from the U.S. Air Force who was captured just after the Japanese bombed an aircraft unit on Nichols Field close to Manila. The Americans fought bravely, but in the end, many of them were killed or taken prisoner. Hogan looks at this young man, Captain Tim Flowers, and recounts the memories of the march 
They were shoved into the boxcars where there was so little room that they all had to stand up. By the time the train arrived at its destination, many prisoners already weakened from the march died. Nothing, Hogan thinks, can be worse than having a dead guy propped up against you for hours in a sweltering train carriage. Flowers said he also can't imagine anything worse than what happened at his own camp in the Philippines. He too has seen the worst of humanity. Guys slowly dying, looking like skeletons, sleeping in their own feces. Every single day, he tells Hogan, we were digging another grave. Flowers doesn't have the stats at hand, but a US prison doctor ended up crunching the numbers. The doctor was Colonel James W. Duckworth. Duckworth wrote that from April 15, 1942 to July 10, 1942, 21,684 Filipino POWs died in the camps. That was 249 a day. 1,488 Americans died, more than 17 a day. On one particularly bad day, May 22nd, 471 Filipinos died as well as 77 Americans. Wherever they're taking us agree the men can't be as bad as that. As the ship rolls through the waves, taking them who knows where, the two men form a bond while talking about their lives back in the US. Flowers comes from a farming family out in rural Ohio, where he says life is simple. He used to wake up every day next to his wife in a house where the smell of baked bread filled his nostrils. Hogan is a city boy from the tough streets of New Jersey, but he wouldn't have it any other way. Day 3 A few prisoners have already died. The men still haven't been fed, and so for some already starving POWs, the journey is just too much. The Japanese don't even throw the dead overboard, and the deceased soon start to stink in the ultra-humid conditions. Most of the prisoners have ripped bits of their clothes off to make a rudimentary face mask. As bad as it is, it's nothing they haven't seen before. Hogan turns to Flowers and asks him, what's the worst thing you ever saw at the camp? Flowers doesn't spend too long thinking about it. He tells Hogan, one time the Japanese threatened the prisoners with death and mass if they didn't work harder. They made good on the threat. He said they forced around 150 prisoners to dig their own graves. Then, they were all thrown in and the soldiers covered them in gasoline and set them on fire. It was the expressions on their faces as they were digging that I'll never forget, says Flowers, and how the Japs thought the whole thing seemed normal. It was like they had no humanity left in them. Day 4 One of the prisoners is delirious. Stuffed down in the cargo hold, the prisoners can hardly breathe. It's enough to send anyone mad. What makes it worse is that the Allies have no idea these ships are carrying their own soldiers, so there's always a chance the ship could be taken out by an Allied submarine or a plane. This will happen to many of the Japanese hell ships throughout the war, killing many if not all of the POWs on board. Of the 126,000 Allied soldiers that will make this journey during the war, about 21,000 won't get to their destination alive. For some of their families, it'll be decades before they know what really happened. In some cases, when Allied bombs do drop and the ships burn, the prisoners try to clamber out of the holds, but as soon as they pop their heads above deck, they're shot. The threat of death from a bullet usually doesn't stop others from trying, because anything's better than being burned alive. The delirious soldier doesn't know what he's doing. He's swinging a canteen above his head. The urine he's kept in it sprays over the other men. More mayhem ensues as he lunges out at one of the guys. He snarls like a dog and sinks his teeth into the man's arm. Just two years before this nightmare, he managed a gas station with his pop. Having heard the shouting, Japanese soldiers rush down to the hold and start lashing out with their batons. One of the prisoners suffocates as he's squashed between men who are just trying to get out of the way of the batons. It's 110 degrees in the hold. The prisoners barely have a few inches of space in which to move. A bloodied man then tries to stand, only to slip on the pervasive feces and vomit. He falls back, hits his head, and passes out. The other men barely give him a second look, as he lays dying in the sludge of human waste. Someone must be peeing on the deck again. The pee rains down on the fallen fella. This is why they're called hell ships. Day 5 The ship is under attack from allied planes. The prisoners sit and grit their teeth as the bombs fall from the sky. They hear screaming from the decks. These are not the screams of soldiers. The ship's passengers include almost a thousand Japanese civilians. Women and children duck for cover as more gunfire rains down on them. Three of the prisoners climb the ladder hoping to reach the deck. Machine gun fire erupts, and one by one they all fall back down, now covered in their own blood. The chaplain takes stock of the dead men that now surround him. He mutters under his breath, forgive them, they know not what they do. An hour or so later, Japanese soldiers collect the dead prisoners. Each one is thrown overboard without a modicum of respect. The Japanese don't want the prisoners to die, even though it might sometimes seem that way. It's counterintuitive to kill your slaves. There's work to be done, the most brutal work imaginable. Quite literally, the prisoners get a taste of things to come. On the ship, the same rules apply regarding sustenance. That's 10 ounces of rice daily, the same as in the camps. They might get 4 ounces of fish a month if they're lucky, 
Pork is a luxury, but by the time it gets to the prisoners, it's usually already rancid. Men dying from dysentery is a daily occurrence, and with only around 200 calories of food a day, coupled with backbreaking work, the prisoners soon become dangerously emaciated. Just little water was provided for the hundreds of, or thousands of prisoners. Many would wait for hours at a time just to fill a small canteen with dirty water. Rivers or other bodies of water would often be dirty enough to spread dysentery. Others will starve because the food won't even get to them. It'll be stolen by the Japanese guards who themselves at times will be starving. These soldiers will steal the Red Cross parcels that are sometimes sent to the camp. Of the 27,000 Americans that the Japanese take prisoner, only 60% of them will survive. One in three of the 140,000 Allied POWs from the West won't return to their families. Day 20. The ship finally arrives at its destination, although the prisoners have no idea where they're about to disembark. There are many POW camps in Japan, but many in China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Korea, New Guinea, Malaya, Singapore, the Philippines, Manchuria, and quite a sizable number of prisoners in Thailand, only recently called Siam, Burma, now Myanmar, and the Dutch East Indies, now Indonesia. Many of the Allied prisoners are from the USA, Australia, Canada, Great Britain, India, the Netherlands, and New Zealand. Outside of Japan, enslavement consists of doing things such as building bridges and railways, such as the so-called Death Railway, spanning Thailand and Burma. It's there that around 60,000 Allied POWs work in savage conditions. Close to 90,000 Southeast Asian civilians also work and die building this railway. In Japan itself, the prisoners sometimes work in deadly coal mines. Some of them help to build munitions factories and shipyards, but this is no ordinary work. It's slavery. If the men don't die from malnutrition or disease, there's a good chance they'll be beaten to death or shot. Some of the more unruly prisoners will be set on fire. If the ship was hell, the camps are just another level of hell. You could argue that the lowest depth in which a prisoner can sink is being part of one of the unholy medical experiments ran at some of the camps. These match anything the Nazis are doing. If the Kenpai Tai, aka Japan's Gestapo, select men for experimentation, they will experience a truly horrifying death. But Colonel Hogan and Captain Flowers are, for now, just relieved that they've made it through that grueling journey across the ocean. They don't know it yet, but they've landed in Taiwan. The two men part ways at the dock. Hogan tells the younger man, when this is all over, I'm going to go see you in Ohio. Flowers smiles and says, deal, but he knows there's a good chance they'll never see America again. Hogan and a group of other prisoners have been told nothing about where they're being sent. They know better than to ask. If they so much as look at a Japanese soldier the wrong way, they might get the butt of a rifle smashed into their face. As they're herded onto a train, they quietly chat among themselves. Some of them are British, Australian, Canadian, American, and Dutch. Day 21. Hogan is sitting in a bamboo hut with around 20 other guys. Some of the other men are close to death already. One guy, a Brit, goes by the name of Tommy, notices how distraught Hogan looks. Tommy tells him, word of advice, mate. If you want to get through this, keep your eyes open for mice and rats. If you're lucky, you might catch a snail or a snake. Other than that, you'll have to rely on the rice they give us, which as you can see isn't anywhere near enough, especially if you're sent to work in the copper mine. Tommy explains that there's no such thing as medical care. He tells Hogan that sometimes the guards beat the prisoners for no good reason. It's as if after getting in trouble with their commanders, they take their anger out on the POWs. This is almost a daily occurrence, says Tommy. Japanese officers often strike their subordinates. Consequently, the subordinates hit out at the only people below them the prisoners. Just be thankful, says Tommy, that you're not in Burma building that railway. He tells Hogan that he was there, but right now he doesn't want to talk about it. He'll tell him the details later. Just as Tommy said, the amount of rice Hogan sees in his dish each day is pitiful. He's just worked for 14 hours straight on the nearby mountainside, planting sweet potatoes and peanuts. His job today is to spread fertilizer on the ground. It's not a pleasant job, given the fertilizer comes from the fly-infested open latrines in the prisoners' huts. Japan didn't sign the Second Geneva Convention of 1929. This means the prisoners in Japan's eyes are fair game for any kind of horrible treatment. The country does have rules according to the regulations of the treatment of POWs, but how they're applied differs greatly from camp to camp. In the better camps, prisoners can use their earnings to buy more food, cigarettes, or a coat for the winter, but in the other camps, none of these things is available. The going rate of pay, if prisoners are paid at all, is 10 sen a day for a private, 15 sen for a non-commissioned officer, and 25 sen for an officer. The money isn't hard cash, but a number written in an account book. Day 23. Hogan is handed some items. These include tenugui, a Japanese cotton towel, jikatabi, some work shoes, and gunte, work gloves. Relief soon turns to despair. He's supposed to bow when receiving things, and this particular guard isn't in a good mood since he's just been told off himself. He gives Hogan a good smack in the face, an action the Japanese call binta. Tommy says to him, you're lucky mate, 
He points to a guy under a blanket in a corner. He was made to stand for 12 hours with a bucket of water on his head, says Tommy. When he spilled some, he got his jaw cracked with a rifle butt. He's now dying from an infection. That's when Tommy tells him the story about the two men who tried to escape from another camp. They were Coleman Grealish of the 60th CAC US Army and Thomas Joinson, a Brit from England's Manchester Regiment. They actually made it out, says Tommy. But it's safe to say those two white geezers wandering around Japan during wartime turned a few heads. They were both arrested and subsequently interrogated by the Kempai Tai. What exactly happened to Grealish and Joinson at the hands of their interrogators is unknown, but Tommy says they were later dragged in front of all the men during a parade, both of them quite literally broken, their faces no longer recognizable. They didn't even have the strength to stand up. The English-speaking Japanese commander announced to the prisoners take one good look at these men because it's the last time you'll ever see them. They were transferred to another camp, and according to Tommy, they were forced to dig their own graves and then beheaded. Tommy is actually wrong. This is a rumor that circulated in the camps. Both men were shot and killed. Rumors like this often get around the camps because stuff like that does happen from time to time. Day 28 There's a massive storm and the copper mine flooded. Hogan finds out that six prisoners have died. The guards don't even bother to try to pull them out of the mine. Hogan thinks about the wives on the other side of the world that will likely never know where their husbands died. One day, a man in uniform will turn up at their doors and deliver a message, missing in action. Day 30 Hogan has a new job. He's tilling the ground so sugarcane can be planted. The work is simple enough. Take out all the larger stones and put them in a basket. The stones will later be transported. Nothing goes to waste. He starts at 7 a.m. and works until 5 p.m. He's given one break all day. He does this work on an empty stomach and under the scorching sun. Some of the prisoners collapse in the field, and at the end of the day, when work is inspected, they're told they haven't met their stone quota. As a punishment, each man is beaten with a stick. Hogan watches in horror as one starved man, his legs full of fluid from malnutrition, has water beaten out of his wounds. The man who ordered the beatings, First Lieutenant Tamaki, is a sadist. An evil grin widens on his face as he announces he has another quota. He intends to fill the cemetery before the war is finished, and Japan is victorious. As Hogan is lying on his bed, he thinks about flowers and his farmhouse back in Ohio. He can almost smell the bread that flowers told him about. He imagines flowers, a good-looking man waking up next to his pretty wife, and just hopes flowers is okay. Day 40 Today, there are new arrivals, about 15 men, mainly American, start filling the huts. A high-ranking prisoner named Priestley has just come from the Shirakawa camp, also in Taiwan. He tells Hogan the guards there allowed the prisoners to form a scout group. They were also allowed to put on plays, and they even made a magazine they called Taggle Raggle. Priestley tells Hogan they were almost worked to death and survived on meager rations, but the Japanese soldiers were also half-starved. The soldiers knew that demoralized men don't work well, so instead of beating the prisoners, they tried to improve morale. And get this, says Priestley, the guards even took them on fishing trips. What? says Hogan, laughing. Priestley tells them that it was likely just propaganda to show outsiders that they looked after POWs like a civilized nation would. Still, they were also allowed to listen to the gramophone music and Radio Tokyo every day they got English-language Japanese newspapers to read. Priestley laughs again, explaining that on Radio Tokyo there was a woman presenter who went by the name of Tokyo Rose. She delivered news in English saying ridiculous things. This was more propaganda. One day she announced that an American plane had been shot down with nothing but rice balls. Day 50 Hogan is told by another new prisoner about a military prison called Taihoku City Prison. The prisoner says some US Navy fighter pilots and Army Air Force fighter pilots and bomber air crews were sent there to be interrogated, and they never made it out. After forced confessions and a mock trial, the men were sentenced to death. The new prisoner tells Hogan that he was there when 25 US airmen were taken into the prison courtyard and executed by firing squad. It was a sad day indeed, more so because the men were executed for effectively just doing their job flying planes. This is a war crime, but Japan doesn't seem to care. Much worse is happening right now in other camps. Hogan is about to find out. Day 88 One of the men in Hogan's camp, driven insane by hunger, is being executed today for attacking a guard. He really hurt the guard, so the Japanese want to make an example out of him. The man, an Australian named John Goodson, is brought out by the guards and forced to kneel. He's then given two minutes to pray. Around him, the guards stand holding fixed bayonets in their hands. Goodson bends over, offering his neck to the executioner. The executioner lifts his sword above his head and then carefully lowers the blade to Goodson's neck. He then holds it aloft once more and strikes down, cleanly severing the head from Goodson's body. Some prisoners watching hear a hissing sound for a moment as they watch his head tumble forward and blood fizz out. After the prisoners return to their huts, one of them writes in his diary, It's amazing. He's killed him with one stroke. The head detached from the trunk rolled forward in front of it. The dark blood gushes. It's all over. 
The head is dead white like a doll. A Dutch prisoner named Jan Bras, who's just come from another camp, surprises everyone when he says Goodson was fortunate. Bras tells them that the Japanese captured his father and the guards put a tube into his mouth. They then poured water down the tube until his stomach burst. Tommy listens to all these stories with a stricken look on his face. He catches Hogan's eye, who's now wondering what kind of hell Tommy endured in Thailand. Yet again, Hogan wonders what fate might have befallen his buddy, Flowers. Day 250 It's only now that Tommy feels like sharing his story with Hogan about what happened when he was building that railway. This was a 250-mile track that connected Thailand to Burma, an important piece of war infrastructure that helped the Japanese move men and equipment. Tommy had worked on a bridge, what the Allies called the bridge over the River Kwai. At first, Thailand had wanted no part in the war, but after the Japanese entered the country, surrender soon followed. The railway was to be a feat of engineering that would pass over rivers and through rugged jungle terrain. Nonetheless, the Japanese expressed that time was of the essence. Whatever it takes, they said, get that track done fast. Hell ships and trains started to bring prisoners over to Thailand, although many civilians were also forced into slavery to complete the project. This included 90,000 Burmese and 75,000 Malayans, many of whom would eventually die. As Tommy tells this story, at one point he becomes sentimental when he tells Hogan about a Scottish bloke named John Many. Without the Japanese knowing, many drew sketches of the backbreaking work they were doing. Tommy explains that the men were dropping like flies from overwork and fierce heat. Some were beaten to death before his eyes, while others died from malaria, cholera, and sometimes tropical ulcers. Even though there were some foreign medics, hardly anyone had experience with tropical diseases. Each day and every night, the homemade funeral pyres burned. The stink of rotten flesh filled the men's noses every night before they went to sleep. But Tommy says it was the guard's brutality he'll never forget. He said that one of his Australian mates, Ringer Edwards, and two other guys were punished by the Japanese for stealing cattle. They strung the men up crucifixion style and beat them with bats. The other prisoners were told not to go near them as they slowly died. It was a death sentence, but after 63 hours, Ringer managed to free himself from his wire binds. Some of the other prisoners sneaked him some food. He survived the ordeal, but the other two men crucified with him died. It was like that day after day, says Tommy. We worked 18 hours a day, mostly in mosquito-infested jungles, and if for a moment we stopped, we were beaten horrendously. They received rations of water, but never clean water. They sometimes got meat with their rice, but it was often foul and full of maggots. It's one reason why a third of the deaths were from dysentery and diarrhea. Tommy says there was a hero who treated the men, who often stood up to the Japanese despite the risk. He was an Australian army surgeon named Ernest Weary Dunlop. But in spite of Dunlop's valiant efforts, there were just too many sick men. When the disease or the beatings were just too much, the men were taken to the death hut to die in peace. Tommy said he'd go to sleep at night and wake up among men who died in their sleep. The Japanese army didn't give a damn. These men had surrendered, so they were worthy of no respect. Tommy tells Hogan the guards were often unpredictable, so one day you could make one laugh, and the next he'd beat you senseless. Tommy's face expresses utter disgust when he tells Hogan, my good mate Banksy, thought he was getting along with a guard we called Pumpkin on account of his large head. One day he tried to cage a cig off Pumpkin and he took offense. He was beaten to death in front of my eyes. Hogan finds this hard to listen to, and he's wondering what cig means. His hopes would be buoyed if he knew what was happening in Europe. Germany's taken a sound beating on the western and eastern front. Moreover, the US has Japan on the back foot. American troops at times are actually committing their own war crimes by massacring surrendering Japanese soldiers. Sometimes they mutilate the dead, and what they sometimes did with the women is unspeakable. They are at least winning. Day 300 The Japanese War Ministry has just announced that commandants at all POW camps should prepare for the final disposition. This means that if the Allies should invade, the camps are to be liquidated. The Ministry explains it is the aim not to allow the escape of a single one to annihilate them all and not to leave any traces. Hogan doesn't know it, but there's a date hanging over his head for extermination. Day 315 Something's happened, but the prisoners have no idea what. The guards, every last one of them, look depressed. This must be good news, thinks Hogan, as he tries to conceal his joy. Day 320 Have you heard? Tommy says to Hogan. Hogan looks nonplussed. The Japs, they've surrendered. One of the British men in the same hut opens his diary and writes, Things are happening. First got a tip off of Japan tossing it in. The war is over and in a few days we shall be free. No more hunger, disease and crowding, filth and ill treatment. Just to see our people again. What a feeling. Day 321 Tommy writes in his diary, we heard that a devastating bomb has been dropped on Hiroshima and practically wiped it and its population out. Still, now the men are wondering if a super bomb will drop on them too. The fear is evident on all the men's faces, to be killed by the Allies when they have suffered for so long. Day 323 
Allied soldiers parachute into Taiwan. They bring food and supplies with them. This Allied Liberation Force is heavily armed in case they meet with any resistance. In a Thai prison camp not far from the Death Railway, a man writes in his diary, Suddenly, the camp lights went full on. The guards had gone. We thought at first they had gone to have some sake, but they never returned. Suddenly, the band started to play Land of Hope and Glory. In a Japanese camp, another prisoner writes, Excitement is at a fever pitch. It must have been 10 a.m. when the first aircraft engines we heard. We yelled and waved like mad, but they passed over. Then came the most beautiful sight I'd ever seen. They had spotted us. Day 330. Hogan and the other men are released. Many of them now weigh under 100 pounds. They're told not to eat too quickly, otherwise they'll get ill. Japanese guards, some of whom have beaten the prisoners time and again, hand out cigarettes. The prisoners are too happy right now to think about reprisals. It's only when they find out that the Japanese have been hiding Red Cross parcels from them all the time. Prisoners have died of starvation when food was there for them to eat. Some men are so sick with malnutrition they'll make it home but succumb to illness within weeks. Day 331. A tragedy happens. With the best intentions, the US drops 60-gallon oil drums full of food and supplies from the skies, but the parachutes don't open. One prisoner writes, some hit the building, and the tragedy of it all was that after surviving three and a half years of captivity, three prisoners were killed as well as Japanese soldiers and Taiwanese civilians. Day 332. American Marines are liberating the last of the Taiwanese camps. Some prisoners have to be carried like children in the Liberator's arms. They're taken to the docks where they're put onto an American destroyer. From his cabin, a man writes, Taiwan became a speck on the horizon. I felt it was an escape from hell. At the same time, British paratroopers are taking men from another camp. Some of them are so weak, they die before they even get to the ship. But many are rejoicing and already thinking about life back home. Day 333. Hogan's ship is in the middle of the ocean heading back to the US. As he goes for a stroll along the deck, he sees a face he's wanted to see for a long time. It's Flowers. He's alive. The two embrace like long-lost brothers. Flowers has a similar story to tell. He was at a Japanese camp, but as time went on and he was sure he was going to die, he and some other men attempted to escape. It didn't go too well for him. He was accused of being a ringleader and sent to a military prison. There, he was interrogated and tortured by the Kinpaitai. I met some more Americans in there, he tells Hogan, but I don't know what happened to them. He'd actually met some of the nine soldiers whose US B-29 Super Fortress had been rammed by a Japanese fighter plane. It crashed and the men were arrested. Those nine men were experimented on by the Japanese. They had seawater injected into them. One had a bit of his lung removed, another lost his liver and another part of his brain. These brutal surgeries were likely performed without anesthetic being administered. All the men died. Flowers doesn't know he was due to be sent to Unit 731. This was the center of brutal medical experiments where the Japanese killed over 500,000 people, mostly Chinese, many of whom were women and children. No one who went into that came back out alive. If the war had not ended, Flowers might have experienced vivisection without an anesthetic. He might have been frozen to death or been set on fire with a flamethrower. He could have been injected with diseases or had a biological weapon tested on him. He might have had a limb amputated, been injected with horse blood, or had his stomach surgically removed. But as he chats with Hogan, so glad to be alive, he has no idea how close he came to that dreadful fate. Americans won't know about such atrocities for many years because the US authorities gave many of the Japanese doctors immunity. They covered the whole thing up to gain the knowledge of the human experiments. After all, the Soviet Union was now a threat. World peace was off the table, again. It's not something Flowers and Hogan were aware of as they look out over the ocean. They're just happy to be alive. When they return home, Flowers to his Ohio farm and Hogan to his beloved New Jersey, they'll commit themselves to their own cover-up. Nobody needs to know what they've endured and seen. They won't think about the camps themselves, not often, other than when the horrors infiltrate their dreams. With Asia behind them and America in the distance, they silently agree it's time to start life over again. Operation Outward came about mainly because of an accident. British barrage balloons were gigantic balloons filled with helium and tethered to the ground by steel cables. They were meant for ground defense, making it hard for aircrafts to perform low-flying bomb attacks. Overnight on September 17th and 18th, 1940, there was a raging storm. Gale force winds ripped loose a bunch of British barrage balloons and carried them across the North Sea toward mainland Europe. Within a few hours, there were several reports of electrical outages in countries such as Sweden, Finland, and Denmark. 
The balloon's trailing cables had struck power lines, disrupted railways, and even knocked down the antenna for the Swedish international radio station. A few days later, the British War Cabinet received a report about the incident. Previously, in 1937, Britain had considered using balloons as offensive weapons of war but chose not to pursue such a program. With accidental proof of how effective balloons could be, Winston Churchill directed the use of free-flying balloons as a weapon of war to be investigated. During the winter of 1940, as Britain began to ponder using the balloons, the empire was in a precarious position. In June, their own ally France had fallen to the Germans. Throughout the late summer and into the fall, the British Royal Air Force, or RAF, had fought the Luftwaffe, Nazi Germany's Air Force, in several air skirmishes in what came to be called the Battle of Britain. The British Empire prevailed, serving Hitler his first major defeat. However, the cost of the battle was enormous in both manpower and resources. If Britain was going to invest in a balloon offensive project, it needed to be worth their while. While it would be around six months before Britain gained another ally in the Soviet Union, and close to a year before the USA joined the war. As luck would have it, the balloons were the perfect low-key weapon to wreak havoc on Germany. Britain has favorable weather conditions for such a mission. High altitude winds generally blown from the west to the east from the British Isles. Even if the wind wasn't blowing in the exact direction, it didn't matter, since the Third Reich controlled much of mainland Europe. The balloons didn't have to be aimed at a target or even especially accurate. Furthermore, power lines in Germany were particularly susceptible to the balloons. Pre-war German electricity grids used slow-acting circuit breakers and Peterson coils as opposed to the faster-acting circuit breakers, which could quickly isolate damage caused by the British. If a balloon cable drifted across two or more power lines, it was highly likely to cause a short circuit or damage the power line enough that it would most probably break in the future. Also, the British Royal Navy had a stockpile of 100,000 surplus latex weather balloons, which made the operation cost-effective. On March 20th, 1942, the first balloons launched from HMS Beehive, near Felixstowe in Suffolk County, not far from the southeast coast of the UK. It was a joint operation, with 230 men and women from the Royal Navy, Royal Marine, Women's Royal Navy Service, and the RAF Balloon Command, and the Naval Meteorological Services working together. For security reasons, the launch crews were given the cover story of being part of a boom defense unit. The spherical balloons, when inflated with hydrogen, had a diameter of 8 feet. To prevent escape, the balloons were inflated inside three-sided tents or windbreaks. During inflation, the balloons were sprayed with water to avoid friction between the latex balloon and the tent canvas, otherwise the hydrogen might have accidentally ignited. Then, the crew members conveyed the balloons by hand to a dispersal point, where a payload was attached. It could be a dangerous job, and launch crews wore protective gear, including fireproof black gloves, during balloon handling. In several instances, members of the launch crew required medical treatment for burns caused by exploding balloons or other mishaps. The balloons were launched between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. when the wind and weather were suitable. Just before launch, a slow-burning fuse was lit on each balloon. The length of the fuse was determined by the estimated time it took the balloon to arrive over German-controlled territory. Once released, the balloons rose rapidly, around 25,000 feet. An internal cord would tighten and prevent further ascension by releasing some gas. The balloon would then begin a slow descent due to the hydrogen gradually leaking away. After a while, the slow-burning fuse would release a plug from a can of mineral oil. As the oil slowly dripped out, the balloon's payload would lighten, moderating its descent. The fuse also was used to release the balloon's weapon. There were a number of payloads a balloon might carry, trailing wire or explosives, which were codenamed beer, jelly, and socks. For the balloons that carried a trailing wire, the slow-burning fuse would melt through the cord that held the wire deploying it. The trailing wire itself consisted of 700 feet of hemp cord with a brake strength of 40 pounds that was attached to a tail of 300 feet of wire. The wire was dragged for about 30 miles, in the hopes that it would encounter a high-voltage transmission line and cause a phase-to-phase -phase short circuit. After a while, Germany switched to a new type of line conductor clamp and changed overcurrent protection settings to better protect their transmission lines against the trailing British balloons. It didn't help. One of the incendiary devices was codenamed Beer. It consisted of an 8.5-inch diameter, 9-inch tall metal canister. It contained seven or eight half-pint bottles that worked as SIPs, self-igniting phosphorus grenades, composed of white phosphorus, benzene, water, and raw rubber. The canister was attached to the slow-burning fuse. Once the fuse burned out, the canister would tip open and drop the SIPs. On contact, they shattered and spontaneously ignited. If SIPs landed on a city, they could damage buildings or cause mayhem. If they landed in a forest or or grassland, it could cause a wildfire. Even the threat of exploding balloons elevated the risk of fire. It forced the German government to form a citizen group of fire observers whose job it was to report any fire nearby and try to extinguish them. Combating wildfires sapped money, time, and human resources from the war effort. 
Another incendiary device was called socks, long, thin canvas bags that were packed with thin wood shavings bound with wire and soaked in hot paraffin wax. The socks ended up weighing about six pounds each. Each balloon would carry three. They were bundled together and fuses were inserted at each end. When deployed, socks formed a V-shaped sausage designed to catch in the crown of a tree. The fuses would ignite and burn from each end of the device for about 15 minutes. Yet another explosive device was called jelly. It was just that, a can about the size of a small office trash bin filled with one imperial gallon of incendiary jelly. It was equipped with a fuse and a release mechanism so it would detonate on the ground. On ignition, it created a large fireball with a radius of about 20 feet. After a little over two years of Operation Outward Running in May of 1944, the program changed tactics because of the increased Allied aircraft activity. The mass balloon launches were stopped and replaced with a trickle of balloons launched from three sites at 10-minute intervals throughout daylight hours. Two new types of payloads, codenamed Lemon and Jam, began to be deployed. Unfortunately, the specifics of these payloads have been lost to history. Lemons were likely small yellow bombs left over from Operation Albino, a trial balloon operation previous to Operation Outward, which failed. JAM is thought to be a device that deployed leaflets. The operation was considered a success. It's hard to gauge the impact of the operation. The British only sometimes received reports of damage from foreign news sources. It's known that the first set of balloons launched caused forest fires near Berlin and in East Prussia. On the 12th of July, 1942, a balloon trailing wire struck a 110,000 volt power line near Leipzig, Germany. This caused the overload switch at the Bolin power station to fail, the station caught fire and was destroyed. The balloons also caused damage in neutral countries. During the night of January 19th and 20th, 1944, two trains collided at Laholm, Sweden, after an Operation Outward balloon knocked out electrical lighting on the railway. Another time, a balloon accidentally drifted back to Britain and caused a power failure in the city of Ipswich. The cost to run Operation Outward was fairly low. The balloons were mass-produced at a cost of 35 shillings each, or about 98 pounds in 2022. The cost in ammunition, inconvenience, and repairs were far higher for Germany. Initially, the Third Reich used Luftwaffe fighter planes to shoot down the bombs, but they eventually stopped due to the high cost involved. They also used anti-aircraft guns to shoot down the balloons, but that had limited success. So one might ask, why didn't the Germans retaliate and use a balloon bomb offensive against Britain? Well, the wind conditions were never in their favor, so any counterattack would just result in balloons being blown back to the German mainland. Japan also had a balloon operation during World War II. It was called Project Fugo, or Fire Balloon. Initially, the 9th Military Technical Research Institute designated balloon bombs to be launched from Japanese submarines stationed on the west coast of America. However, the joint Army-Navy research into this operation ended abruptly when Japan recalled all of its submarines for its Guadalcanal operation in August 1943. The institute switched its focus to designing a trans-Pacific balloon made to float across the Pacific Ocean on the winter jet stream. They discovered it would take the balloons about 60 hours to travel some 5,000 miles to the west coast of America. However, the length of float time came with a big problem. As the sun rose and set, the balloons would expand and contract with a temperature and ascend and descend accordingly. Ultimately, the engineers were able to come up with a clever control system driven by an altimeter to vent the balloons and also discard ballast as needed. Initially, the balloons were made of rubberized silk, but when the balloons went into mass production, a switch was made to washi, a paper made from the bark of the kozo tree. The date of the first launch was chosen because it was an auspicious day, November 3, 1944, the birthday of former Emperor Meiji. The launch process was difficult. It took 30 minutes to an hour to prep one balloon for flight and required about 30 crew members. The main bomb-carrying balloons were 33 feet in diameter and inflated with hydrogen. They had to carry about 1,001 pounds of gear, including explosives and ballast. The Project Fugo program ran on a tight schedule. The balloons could only be launched during certain wind conditions. In the months of November to March, there were only 50 anticipated favorable days. Three balloon battalions launched a maximum of 200 balloons per day from three launch sites on the east coast of Honshu. Between November 1944 through April 1945, the battalions launched over 9,300 fire balloons, and the operation expected about 10% of the balloons to reach their destination. However, only about 300 balloons were known to have reached North America, with it being possible possible that several more balloons landed in unpopulated areas. Balloons were found on the west coast as far north as the Yukon Territory and as far east as South Dakota. The US military sent fighter planes to intercept some balloons, but they were surprisingly tricky to shoot down. 
The balloons flew high and fast. Ultimately, US fighters destroyed fewer than 20. The Royal Canadian Air Force also destroyed a handful of balloons. The US military created the Firefly Project, utilizing 2,700 troops and working with the United States Forest Service to spot and fight wildfires caused by Fugo balloons in the Pacific coastal forests. On March 10, 1945, a Fugo balloon caused a short circuit in the power lines that supplied electricity for the nuclear reactor's cooling pumps at a production facility for the Manhattan Project. Thankfully, backup safety devices restored power almost immediately. There was also lots of curiosity and mild worry as the US public became aware of the balloons. The government warned people to stay away and notified authorities if they found one. After a few articles ran about people finding balloons, the US Office of Censorship asked the press for a blackout on the topic. They didn't want the public to panic, but most importantly, they didn't want Japan to think the balloons were an effective weapon. Meanwhile, US military intelligence was able to collect information from fragments of a balloon and eventually determine where it was produced. From there, they performed aerial reconnaissance, which resulted in them locating two of the hydrogen production plants that produced gas for the balloons. In April of 1945, B-29 bombing raids successfully destroyed the plants. Weeks later, Japan ended Project Fugo. They thought the operation was a failure. Additionally, it was expensive to run and the cost to rebuild the hydrogen plants would have been astronomical. The only fatalities to occur from a balloon bomb happened on May 5, 1945. A church Sunday school group was picnicking in the forest near Gearhart Mountain in southern Oregon and saw a strange balloon on the ground. Suddenly, there were two explosions and six people were killed. Later, a bomb expert would suggest that one of the kids kicked the bomb. In the years since World War II, people have occasionally discovered fragments of Fugo balloons and also still live bombs. Most recently, in 2019, a hunter looking for mountain goats near McBride, British Columbia, found an exploded bomb. But ultimately, the British balloon raids on the German mainland stand as the most effective use of this tactic throughout the war. During the 899 days of Operation Outward, nearly 100,000 balloons were launched. About half carried incendiary devices and half carried trailing wires. At the peak of the operation, 1,500 balloons were launched a day, leading to chaos and a noticeable damage to the German war effort. The United States' astronomical defense budgets are casually thrown around in a lot of political conversations today. But what is all that money being spent on, especially when we're actually at war? We decided to investigate the most expensive war in history, World War II, which cost over $4 trillion, to discover just what the US spent all that cash on. Back when Hitler was raging throughout Europe and Japan was attacking Pearl Harbor, the US decided it needed to help the Allies stop the Axis powers from taking over. To do so, it spent around $4.1 trillion over the span of three years and almost nine months. In those days, the actual sum was just $341.5 billion. But in those days, people also paid 35 bucks a month in rent, so the $4 trillion is adjusted for today's inflation. At the peak of the war in its final year, 1945, the defense budget of the US rose to 37.5% of total GDP. For comparison, in 2020, the US defense budget was around 3.7% of GDP, which is kind of the same as long as you ignore that decimal point that has shifted one giant step to the left. As you can see, a huge chunk of the economy at the time was oriented toward the war. In fact, the US spent much more than any other country involved in the war ever did. Some historians believe this exorbitant spending might have helped them win. To get an idea of how high the US defense spending of $341.5 billion was, the next highest spending country was Germany, which spent a total of $270 billion, even though they spent more years fighting in the actual war. The Soviet Union came out to $192 billion, while Japan spent $56 billion total. So, what did the US spend all this money on? Well, the first order of business was paying the over 16 million servicemen and women who were fighting the war on three different continents. The average private serving in World War II made around $50 a month, or around $680 adjusted for today's inflation. Though it might seem like a ridiculously low amount, even for the 40s, army men actually took home more than those making the average US salary, even though income per capita in 1945 came out to $1,223 per year. Though this might seem illogical at first, when taking into account that the men's food, shelter, clothes, and many other necessities were provided by the army, Barron's Magazine estimated that the average single military man's pay scaled out to the civilian equivalent of 3600 bucks. This pay was further boosted by the fact that any military man making less than $1,500 a year, which was the vast majority of enlisted officers, would not have their income subjected to income tax. Of course, the US was aware that financial incentives such as these might encourage more citizens to enter the war, which is why they passed the Pay Readjustment Act of 1942 a few months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The previous salary for an army private was $21 a month, so the Pay Readjustment Act resulted in more than doubling of the armed forces' salaries. Moving up the ranks, pay understandably increased even more. 
Generals at the time made $666.67 a month, which gave them an annual salary of around 8000 bucks. This means that out of the World War II defense budget, tens of billions were paid out to servicemen and women laying down their lives for years at the front. If we estimate that each soldier was getting a private salary for 3.75 years, that comes out to around $36 billion. However, obviously, there were plenty of people getting higher salaries, not to mention that the Army was also providing the soldiers with billions and billions of dollars in food, shelter, clothing, and other supplies. This was in addition to transporting them to three different continents around the world. Though no exact numbers exist for how much the deployment of all those soldiers cost, it's fair to assume that of the $341.5 billion spent at the time, subtracting the amount spent on equipment, the $158.5 billion left over was mostly spent on training, transporting, feeding, sheltering, clothing, paying, and otherwise supplying personnel. A small percentage of that was also spent on military and government administration costs. Since anyone who's come within five feet of the military knows, the mountain of bureaucracy that must be waded through requires its own economy to function. But as enjoyable as administrative paperwork sounds, let's focus on the military's equipment instead. U.S. aircraft production was the largest part of the war economy. A total of $183 billion was spent on war production, and almost 25% of that, or $45 billion, was spent on airplanes. The money went toward producing over 300,000 planes between 1941 and 1945, including 49,123 bombers, 63,933 fighters, and 14,710 cargo planes, while paying over 2 million workers on the front lines of the production process. The powers at war knew that whichever side ruled the skies would have a massive strategic advantage. Some of the money was spent not only on production but on technological development too. It wasn't enough to have more planes in the sky, it was important for the US and Allied planes to have the most sophisticated equipment possible as well. Heavy bombers like the B-29 Super Fortress were developed thanks to unprecedented cooperation between the Air Force, private contractors, and labor unions. The B-29 project cost $3 billion and resulted in giant technological leaps in radar systems, bomb sites, high performance engines, and metallurgy to name a few. Next, between $13 and $18 billion were spent on the construction of 5,777 ships by the U.S. Maritime Commission during World War II. The federal government directed the shipbuilding and funded entrepreneurs experienced with mass production methods to transfer these technologies over to shipbuilding for quicker production. World War II shipbuilding included the production of 10 battleships, 27 aircraft carriers, and 907 cruisers and destroyers. Additionally, over 211 submarines were built during this time. We've traveled by air, flown by sea. Time to check in on what was being produced for fighting on land, which is where most of the rest of the $183 billion production budget was spent. Over 100,000 tanks and armored vehicles were produced by the U.S. between 1939 and 1945, as well as 41,000 guns and howitzers. Additionally, 12.5 million rifles and carbines, as well as 41 billion rounds of ammunition were produced in factories. At this point, it's important to point out that not all of these weapons and supplies ended up being used by U.S. forces. In fact, many were produced before the U.S. even entered the war and then used to supply the Allies in Europe. Additionally, we have to bring up the darkest chapter of the war, the Manhattan Project. The research that developed and created the atomic bomb was funded with $2 billion at the time, or approximately $29 billion in 2021. For those wondering how a small team of scientists in a lab could have spent that much, we have some surprising news. The Manhattan Project employed over 100,000 people. They used a whole system of laboratories and plants throughout the country, including labs at the University of Chicago and Berkeley, multiple uranium processing complexes, and the famous weapon design lab at Los Alamos, New Mexico. At this point, you might be thinking, how is all this funded? How is it that you've been driving over the same pothole down the street for 10 years and you can't get your city to spend money to send people to fix it? But in World War II, factories everywhere were repurposed and billions and billions of dollars were handed over to fund the most gargantuan war effort in recent history. Well, the war was financed through a couple of different methods, most of which, honestly, probably wouldn't work in the modern-day U.S. First, it's important to point out that the military took over the war effort pretty quickly and was able to redirect a staggering amount of consumer production toward military production without civilian groups having much power to stand in the way. The government created a whole wide range of mobilization agencies, which directed the manufacture of necessary military goods and then purchased them for the armed forces. Though most European wartime manufacturing was directed by councils composed of both civilians and military officials, the Army and Navy had almost unfettered control over the provision of both equipment and personnel for World War II. In many places throughout the U.S., production all but ceased on items like cars, non-military clothing, and non-essential foods. This explains how production was reoriented toward a wartime economy, but not how it was paid for. 
Well, because this was way before the time when the US could just keep shooting its debt up to see what happens, most of the money spent on World War II was funded by war bonds and an increase in income taxes. How much of an increase, you might ask? Trigger warnings for fiscal conservatives. The income tax rate for the wealthy in 1945, defined as those who made over $200,000, around $3 million in modern day, a year maxed out at 94%. You heard that right. That being said, the income tax rate was already between 66 and 79% in 1939 to begin with, so the increase wasn't as crazy as it sounds to our 21st century ears. For comparison, the 2021 top marginal income tax rate was 37%, even though, let's be honest, not a single rich person actually paid that. Tax rates for those in the lowest bracket, which included those making as little as $500 a year, also jumped from 4% to 23% between 1939 and 1945. In fact, the total number of U.S. citizens required to pay taxes jumped from 7.6 million in 1939 to 49.9 million in 1945. It's fair to say everyone was chipping in, whether they wanted to or not. However, the vast majority of World War II funding, 63% to be exact, was covered by war bonds. President Roosevelt purchased the first one on May 1, 1941 to set an example for the country. Celebrities endorsed them and widespread marketing campaigns urged citizens to buy them. They were not so subtle. Everyone watching this has probably heard of war bonds, but how do they actually work? Well, they were sold as a stable source of investment for many citizens. People would buy the bonds at 75% of face value. The bonds would return a 2.9% annual interest after a period of 10 years, to be essentially redeemed for the actual value they represented. Since consumer prices also rose during that time, many civilians didn't necessarily get a good return on their investment, but they wanted to contribute to the war effort anyway. Plus, if they kept the bonds for a period of 30 to 40 years, they might end up making a small profit around 4%, since bonds were granted an interest extension for up to 30 or 40 years. Bonds were available in denominations of 25, 50, 100, 500, and 1,000, with a couple of higher value denominations added later on for the wealthier civilians. Even children could spend the few cents they had on war stamps, which functioned similarly to bonds. By the time the war ended, 85 million people had purchased $185.7 billion worth of US bonds. This comes out to approximately $2,185 in war bonds per person. Though obviously, that's an average, and not reflective of the actual amount an average US citizen spent, since wealthier investors could have skewed the curve. It's still incredibly impressive at a time when the average household, not individual, brought in $2,595 a year. World War II was a time of inconceivable suffering and violence for many countries. Some of the biggest atrocities in recent history were committed during the conflict. If perhaps one silver lining can be gleaned from this video investigating how the US spent over $4 trillion on a war, it's that the whole country managed to organize itself and band together to help stop a genocide and deadly aggressors abroad. People have been fighting wars since the first wooden spears were carved thousands of years ago. Estimates for the total number killed in war throughout all of human history ranges from 150 million to 1 billion people, and according to the New York Times, at least 108 million have been killed in wars in the 20th century alone. With the continuing advances we see in technology, the way we fight wars is constantly changing. Today we'll be looking at how two of the biggest wars in history compare in this episode of the Infographic Show, World War I versus World War II. World War I, also known as the First World War, the Great War, or the War to End All Wars, was a global war. It started in Europe and lasted more than four years, from 1914 to 1918. The conflict was between the central powers of Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Turkey up against France, Britain, Russia, Italy, Japan, and towards the end, in 1917, America. It is one of the largest wars in history, and though sources vary on exact numbers of casualties, it is estimated there were 10 million military deaths, 7 million civilian deaths, and 21 million wounded. World War II, also known as the Second World War, was a global war that lasted for six years from 1939 to 1945, though there were some earlier related conflicts leading up to it. It was the deadliest conflict in human history and included the Axis powers, which were Germany, Italy, and Japan, against the Allied powers of France, Britain, America, the Soviet Union, and China. There were 15 million military deaths, 45 million civilian deaths, and 25 million people wounded. These wars took place more than two decades apart. Let's see how these brutal battles compare side by side. In World War I, each soldier was given a rifle, a bayonet, and three grenades. The first grenades in 1914 were basic and often handmade, consisting of old cans filled with nails and bits of metal and packed with gunpowder. 
The British were the first to introduce tanks into warfare with the Mark I, which was developed in 1915 to break the stalemate of trench warfare. And the Germans introduced machine guns with each battalion having a minimum of six. The Russians had eight machine guns, while the less fortunate British soldiers had only two. Mortars were explosive bombs shot in a projectile motion, and both sides of the battle had their own versions. Heavy artillery was one of the most significant elements in the First World War, and for firing from behind the lines, there was a lighter, more localized form known as field artillery. Gases were commonly used to occupy enemy trenches, barbed wire would be placed near enemy camps to prevent enemy soldiers from entering, and in 1915, the Germans even employed flamethrowers against the French. What about World War II? Well, 25 years later, things had advanced. There were lightweight machine guns, which soldiers could use against low-flying aircraft, as well as well-equipped Navy carriers that had cannons to shoot down heavy aircraft. The bazooka, which you may remember as Hollywood character Rambo's weapon of choice, is an anti-tank, handheld missile launcher, which was used against the German army. The Germans themselves had the Fritz X guided bomb to use against anti-aircraft guns, U-boats to sink American ships, as well as the Panther tank which formed the backbone of the German Blitzkrieg tactic. But the biggest advancement, and probably the most famous weapon of the Second World War, was the atom bomb that was used by the Americans to wipe out the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and end the conflict. With all the injuries that come with war, one of the most important aspects of fighting a long, drawn-out battle is medical support. When World War I broke out in France in 1914, horse-drawn wagons with baskets on either side were used to get a wounded soldier from a battlefield to a hospital. That often meant first being taken to the nearest train station and put in the straw of a cattle car and sent towards the nearest city that had a hospital. No bandages, no food, and no water. One of those trains had dumped about 500 badly wounded men and left them lying between the tracks in the rain with no cover whatsoever, recounted Harvey Cushing, the head of the Harvard Unit of Volunteer Doctors at the American Ambulance Hospital of Paris. But with all these injured soldiers to deal with, doctors actually learned enough to vastly improve a soldier's chances of survival. At the beginning of the war, they only had amputation as a solution, but they learned to disinfect wounds, to operate on the injured soldiers, and repair the damage from enemy artillery. Ambulances, antiseptic, and anesthesia all emerged from the medical community having to deal with millions of deaths in the First World War. When the Second World War arrived, every country was far better prepared, but again, having to deal with an extraordinary number of injuries also changed the medical landscape, most notably with the role of nurses, of which many came from America. Not only did the number of female nurses increase significantly during the war, but the responsibility they carried became more critical. In 1941, the Army Nursing Corps had a mass shortage of nurses with fewer than 7,000 available, leading to the need for nurses to volunteer to serve. In order to join the nursing corps, a woman had to meet certain criteria. Naturally, she had to be a citizen of the United States and to be a registered nurse. From 1943, army nurses were required to undergo additional training such as field sanitation, psychiatry and anesthetics, and physical training to help build up their endurance. They worked closer to battle lines than they did in World War I or any war before. The nurses often worked and served under harsh conditions and had to make emergency decisions on the spot. What about the results of these two devastating conflicts? Following World War I, communism spread among the Soviet Union, resulting in the Russian Revolution of 1917. The Treaty of Versailles resulted in the German army being forced to pay $31.5 billion as reparation for the war. The Empire of Austria-Hungary split their union and formed independent countries of Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. And there was a Great Depression in America. After World War II ended, with the victory of the Allies against Germany and Japan in 1945, the European economy had collapsed, with 70% of the industrial infrastructure destroyed from the war. Germany split in two, with East Germany adopting a communist policy. Hitler and his closest associates committed suicide, but many other associates, especially Hermann Göring, was sentenced to life imprisonment for hate crimes. And the United Nations was formed on October 24, 1945, promising to uphold the peace. Both of these wars had a devastating impact that was felt for many years after. A bright flash of light illuminates the sky over Hiroshima. An atomic bomb has been dropped, killing tens of thousands of people instantly. 
The Emperor of Japan watches as his lands burn. The mushroom cloud of destruction reflects in his eyes. He's made his decision. The Allies will pay. Japan will not surrender. They will not give up. If the Allies want the country, they'll have to pry it from his cold, dead fingers. As history has shown, this is not what happened after the atomic bombs were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Instead, Japan surrendered and World War II came to an end. But what if Emperor Hirohito had not surrendered? What would have happened next? Regardless of what the United States and the Allied forces decided to do, there were going to be enormous amounts of casualties. But could Japan have won the war? In this what-if scenario, the odds are against them. But what Japan had planned, and the hatred that filled the nation for their enemy, was going to lead to a bloody fight for survival. After the atomic bombs are detonated, destroying two entire cities, the emperor, military, and citizens are now ready to fight until the last Japanese falls. There will be no surrender. There will be no mercy. The nation responsible for the mass execution of hundreds of thousands of Japanese civilians must be crushed. The the emperor restates his original plan. Everyone must fight. Men, women, and children must be ready to lay down their lives for their country. And at this time, most of the citizens of Japan would gladly do this. In fact, Japan is already training every able-bodied person to be a soldier in the fight against the US. The Allies need to end the war in the Pacific quickly. Every day that goes by, the casualties on both sides will go up. The United States has already lost so many lives in the Pacific that it's hard to justify sending tens of thousands more to their deaths. If Japan doesn't surrender, the war will rage on and on and on. So, what will the United States do next? Unfortunately, what military leaders have planned is terrifying. Japan is ramping up their training programs. They're assembling more aircraft and vehicles to fight off the Allied forces. The United States now knows the atomic bombs will not be enough to force the Japanese to surrender. But a previous bombing campaign proved to be even more devastating. So, the next move for the United States is to cause more destruction from the air. And the best way to do this is through firebombing the Japanese homeland. On the night of March 9, 1945, Allied forces had unleashed hell on Tokyo. 2,000 tons of incendiary bombs were dropped over 48 hours. It's estimated that between 80,000 and 125,000 people were burnt to death by the bombing run. It also took out many shadow factories that were basically people's homes and shops used to prefabricate war materials before they were shipped to Japan's main factories. Regardless of whether the firebombs destroyed military targets or not, one thing is for sure. The first firebombing of Tokyo was devastating and likely killed over 100,000 and civilians. The carnage that ensued as people tried to flee the flames caused even more casualties. Reports state that the smell of burning flesh was so bad, pilots on the bombing runs had to put on their oxygen masks to keep from vomiting all over their flight consoles. Since the first firebombing campaign was so successful in creating devastation, the United States now has plans to carry out more of these missions. The atomic bombs were catastrophic, but the firebombs seemed to strike even more fear into the enemy. The United States begins conducting more and more firebombing runs in cities that are manufacturing the materials for the Japanese war effort. At this point, Japan needs to ramp up their anti-air capabilities. They pour countless resources and men into creating anti-aircraft guns and planes. The kamikaze pilots target aircraft carriers and air bases where Allied planes can reach the Japanese mainland. The deployment of new US aircraft and ships to the Pacific to replace those being destroyed by Japanese fighters and kamikaze pilots are far away. The United States has burnt entire cities to the ground, and they've unleashed more atomic bombs which have irradiated the Japanese soil. But now, the entire nation and everyone in it is hell-bent on defeating the United States, even if it costs every Japanese life on the planet. As Europe tries to stabilize itself, the other allied countries are hesitant to send more forces into the Pacific. They do not want to leave their countries vulnerable to a resurgence of war on the continent. The United States slowly realizes that it's now on its own to subdue Japan. The closest allied nation to the conflict is the Soviet Union, but they're still recovering from the Nazi campaign into their homeland and getting ready for the next war. On the other hand, if the United States is eventually defeated by Japan, it will leave the country almost defenseless, which would allow the Soviet Union to be in an even greater position of power. Knowing that they can't rely on anyone but themselves, and that they need to end the war with Japan as soon as possible, the United States makes a drastic decision. They must conduct a land invasion in order to end the war once and for all. For all intents and purposes, World War II is over at this point. The Allies have reclaimed Europe and signed the Paris Peace Treaties. Even though Japan hasn't surrendered, Europe starts to rebuild after the devastation of the war. The war in the Pacific is too far away to worry about. The continuation of violence between the United States and Japan develops into its own unique war. The United States knows that it will be American men who are sent to the slaughter by a land invasion, but there seems to be no other choice. The Japanese people are resilient, and even after traditional bombings, fire bombings, and atomic bombings, they continue to fight on. 
The only way to end this war is by cutting off the serpent's head, and to do this Japan must be invaded. This is actually what Japan has been hoping for. They know that if the Americans step foot on Japanese soil, they'll have the advantage. Every single Japanese citizen is willing to lay down their life to defeat the foreign threat. This includes women and children being used to overwhelm the enemy forces. The casualties will be massive on both sides, but the end goal of the Japanese leadership is to make taking Japan so difficult for the United States that they will eventually give it up. In fact, the Japanese know that the last thing the US wants to do is conduct a land invasion. They hope that the resilience from all the bombings would be enough of a deterrent to send the United States packing home. However, that's not what happened. The US prepares the Navy to move in closer to the Japanese mainland. The Japanese people move into position along the coast to fight off any land incursion in their regions. Like the kamikaze pilots in the sky, the average citizen is willing to lay down their life for the emperor on land. The Japanese people are not only soldiers but human bombs as well. As US forces step onto the beaches of Japan, they're met by wave after wave of regular citizens who quickly overwhelm them. Landing parties are fended off. Sometimes the American soldiers can hold the beach for a few days, but eventually more and more Japanese are sent to push them back into the ocean from once they came. And it would seem the Japanese people are not the only ones who are angry about the invasion of their country, and the prolonged war that was now going on for years after the rest of the world agreed on peace. Mother Nature also causes chaos for the American forces. As the land invasion commences, a catastrophic typhoon strikes Japan. The winds, waves, and rain cause naval vessels to become shipwrecked. Soldiers that are encamped on beaches drown in massive floods. Due to sheer willpower and the deployment of tanks and other armed vehicles, the United States finally gains a foothold on the mainland of Japan. Unfortunately, victory is still far from secured. The Japanese people have retreated into the forests, mountains, and other cities on their home island and have begun engaging in guerrilla warfare. The Japanese government has become destabilized and most of the trained military has been killed or is regrouping for a counterattack, but the regular citizens fight on. This isn't surprising since if the United States was ever invaded, every American citizen would fight to the last person to defend their homeland. The Japanese are only trying to fight off an invading force. US soldiers are ambushed in the thick forests by regular citizens using rifles, swords, and improvised explosives. American forces are repelled in the mountains by people held up in fortresses and castles from the days of the samurai. In the remaining cities, people hide in their homes waiting for an unsuspecting soldier to walk by and then quickly dispatch him. They are not given orders by any general or any military leader, they're just trying to defend their homeland from an invading force. Between the weather, enemy military, and the Japanese people, the United States has lost between 500,000 and 1 million soldiers. Reinforcements are still a long way away, especially those arriving by ship. At this point, history could have gone two ways. The first is that the United States gives up and returns back to North America to lick its wounds. If this happened, the Soviet Union may have taken advantage of the vulnerable state the country was in, and the Cold War might have become an all-out battle with the Soviets being victorious. The other outcome, might have been the United States continuously sending resources and men to Japan until the population was finally subdued. There would be no victory as the cost of human life would have been too great. The United States would have needed to keep a military presence in the country to make sure it couldn't rebuild its military, and they would need to put a democracy in place to run the nation. Unfortunately, as history has shown, this is easier said than done. If Japan had never surrendered in World War II, the fighting would have continued on. Surrender wasn't an option, unless the populace was told by the emperor himself that it was necessary. So all Although World War II may have ended, the war in the Pacific would have raged on. The United States would most likely be fighting alone, and the only way that it would have come to an end was through a land invasion. However, if the United States did invade the mainland of Japan, the casualties would have been astronomical. Also, there is no way to know what other countries would do while Japan and the United States were fighting with one another. It's a real possibility that other countries like the Soviet Union would have jumped at the opportunity to gain power while US resources, men, and military vessels were tied up in a war with Japan. As the United States became weaker and weaker, other countries might have become stronger and stronger. A tumbleweed tank? A gun that shoots tornadoes? Airborne mines? Here are 10 more of the most bizarre weapons of World War II you've never heard of. Number 10. The V3 Cannon Hitler liked few things more than shock and awe, and what would be more shocking and awesome than a gun that fired multiple times? The V3 Cannon was designed to be the most advanced and powerful cannon in Germany's arsenal, and it would increase the power of its ammo by hitting it with multiple extra boosts of propellant. As the projectile passed different points in the long barrel, its heat would trigger solid fuel rocket boosters that would increase the projectile's power. It passed initial tests, and German designers thought it could be used to bombard London into submission. Then it all went wrong. The prototype seemed promising, and a model was placed in northern France where the projectiles could span the English Channel. But as early tests at the site fell short, funds were running short, and the project was cut back. Allied bombing raids destroyed much of the site, and soon the plan was abandoned. However, similar weapons were
were used later to bombard Luxembourg in the last year of the war. But as the Nazi war machine came to a crashing halt in 1945, the ultimate fate of the V3 cannon was to be a curiosity of strange weaponry. But it was more intimidating than this next weapon. Number 9. The Bob Semple Tank As World War II raged on, the southern nations of Australia and New Zealand worried that Japan would invade and overwhelm them. While both were involved in the war, their home front defenses were lacking and they had no homegrown fighting vehicles. New Zealand's Minister of Works, Bob Semple, wanted to change that. They would have to work with what they had, and what New Zealand mostly had were hardy old farming vehicles. And so began the greatest makeover in World War II. Can a tractor truly be transformed into a top-of-the-line fighting tank? Magic 8-Ball says, Outlook Cloudy. The Bob Simple tank was built on a standard Caterpillar D8 crawler tractor, easy to get in New Zealand, and equipped with armor and machine guns. However, the tank was small and hard to use. One gunner had to be lying down on a mattress to use his gun, and the tank was armored with corrugated plating rather than full armor. In early tests, the armor didn't hold up, and the heavy vehicles were hard to maneuver. In the end, the tanks were scrapped before even making it to combat, probably for the best. But they did have a strange place in New Zealand's heart as a symbol of wartime ingenuity. But some oddball weapons weapons are successes, smashing successes. Number 6. Bouncing Bomb It doesn't look like much, a large rolling cylinder that resembles an oil drum. In decades to come, video game players would watch a plumber jump over barrels that look a lot like it. But the Bouncing Bomb packed a powerful punch, and it might have helped turn the tide of war for the Allies. When the British Royal Air Force was looking to destroy some key German dams, they ran into a problem. The dams were protected at the base by anti-torpedo nets, and damaging the tops wouldn't destroy them. They needed a new type of bomb, and British engineer Barnes Wallace delivered. The bombs, codenamed Upkeep, were designed to be fired at a lower height than typical bombs and weighed much less than conventional bombs that could destroy the dam. In the famous Operation Chastity, a team of soldiers known as the Dam Busters engaged in a risky mission to deliver the payload. The bombs could be dropped at just 60 feet, bounce across the water, then sink under and explode, cracking the base of the dams and causing massive floods in the region. It wasn't even technically a bomb, it functioned more like a massive depth charge, but it was as effective as the test showed, although the use was extremely specific. But not every inventive weapon design works out. Number 7. Unrotated Projectile One of the biggest challenges for the UK in World War II was stemming the massive bombardment coming from Nazi-occupied Europe. That created a lot of unique anti-aircraft weapons, some more effective than others. The UP projector sounded like a great concept, a rocket system that would launch without being spin-stabilized. Instead, it would launch a rocket that would release a mine attached to three parachutes. The wires attached to the parachute would snag the enemy planes, pulling the mine into them. As soon as the mine hit the enemy, kablam! One less plane that could bombard London. But what works on paper doesn't always work in practice. The system had many flaws. First, it was slow to load and the crews responsible were often vulnerable to enemy fire while working on it. Second, it was a low-tech solution in an increasingly high-tech war, and the maneuverable German planes might be able to dodge the wires. But when Winston Churchill intended a test, a bigger flaw became clear. If the winds were too strong, the bombs could actually be blown back onto the ship and blow them up. The dummy rounds caused no real damage, but in war, this could be a disaster, so the unrotated projectile was consigned to the storage locker before long. But the Allies weren't the only ones creating bizarre weapons. Number 6. Windkanone Hitler was a big fan of big ideas, and there was no bigger idea than the one that his army could literally harness the forces of nature against the enemy. The Nazis created many large weapons, but this one, with a distinctive upward-pointing snout, intended to create a synthetic tornado. A large pipe would be filled with explosive gas, a turbine would spin it, and it would be released into the atmosphere through a rotating nozzle. Air would be drawn into the spiral and create a vortex that could down enemy aircraft as they approach without ever firing a shot. But if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. The Windkanone did actually work, creating tornadoes that could destroy wooden sheds over 300 feet from the gun. But when it came to shooting them up in the air, it was a different story. The gun only created tornadoes around 900 feet above the ground, and aircraft on bombing raids are usually high above that level. So the Windkanone was a scientific breakthrough, but there's a big difference between that and actually being a useful weapon in combat. Hey, at least everyone on the test got one heck of a show. Other weapons of the war were a lot smaller. Number 5. The William Tell The Office of Strategic Services played a key role in winning the war, sending American spies around the globe, and effective spycraft required stealth, which meant OSS members wouldn't be able to carry standard noisy handguns. Many strange weapons were created, often with mixed results, and one found its origins hundreds of years ago in the Middle Ages. The William Tell was believed to be 
the quietest weapon in the OSS arsenal, and it combined the accuracy of a crossbow with the power of a slingshot. But how did it handle in combat? While it worked like a slingshot, it used a rubber harness instead of a traditional bill that made it a lot more compact and muffled the telltale snap of the slingshot. It could launch a deadly projectile at close range, but the problem was arrows rarely kill silently. The enemy is hit, and even if it's a fatal blow, the odds are they're going to stay conscious long enough to let everyone know they've been shot and there's an enemy afoot. So the OSS kept looking for the perfect stealth weapons that would help them win the war. Another attempt was more successful and stranger. Number 4. Sedgley OSS-38 The Sedgley OSS-38 was a simple device. It was a single-shot pistol that was ideal for covert operations and assassinations. Geared toward the Pacific Theater, it was meant to make it easier for the assassin to cover their tracks. To cover up an assassination, hitmen would often wear gloves to keep themselves from being identified. This cut out the middleman by attaching the pistol to the back of a simple cowhide glove, making it a portable weapon that the users could wear and disguise in the sleeve of a long coat. So how did the glove pistol actually work? Instead of having a standard trigger, the pistol was armed with a bar extending beyond the barrel. Triggering it was as simple as loading and cocking the pistol safely, then making a fist and pressing the trigger next to the target's body. One shot is fired and the target is fatally shot, without a gun being anywhere in sight. The OSS didn't divulge how many times, if any, this unique weapon was used, but it's believed they manufactured as many as 200 guns for use on top secret missions. Other unique World War II weapons were a lot bigger. Number 3. The X-Class Submarine When you think about submarines, you usually think about massive vessels streaming through the waters, but during World War II, the British were looking for stealth. That's where the X-Class came into play. These miniature submarines were built during the 1940s and needed to be towed to their target by a larger submarine. Once they were unleashed, they could hold a crew and some powerful weapons. They were ideal for sneaking into target areas while being less visible to German sonar. But there were a few difficulties with the X-Class. For one thing, to get the crew from the main submarine to the X-Class meant they needed a third vehicle, a dinghy, to ferry the crew, during which they would be vulnerable. The X-Class was also prone to leaking in the early tests, with several ships being lost. The model was liked by the brass because it made it possible for crews to stay submerged far longer than other small models, but practical issues derailed it quickly, and the X-Class was ultimately scuttled. The small submarine went to a museum, but the Royal Navy built on the design and introduced better, hardier models. But as we head toward number one, things are getting really strange. Number two, Kugelpanzer. Imagine being on the battlefield and suddenly you see what looks like a giant tumbleweed rolling toward you. But it's not a tumbleweed. It's a spherical rolling tank designed by Nazi Germany, and it's going to roll right over you. It's the Kugelpanzer, one of the strangest weapons ever designed for use in World War II. It's a one-man vehicle with thin but durable armor, two rolling treads attached to the sides, and an eye slit for the driver to see through. Only one model was ever found and was captured by the Soviets in Manchuria. But even with it in their custody, there were more questions than answers. The one model found was unfinished and seems to have never been used in combat. It was designed to be used as a light reconnaissance vehicle rather than a combat vehicle because it had no attached weapons, although some could have been added later. The unfinished model is now on display at the Kubinka Tank Museum, and debates continue over what exactly it was supposed to be. The only thing that's certain, whatever it was, it wasn't successful enough for the Nazis to mass produce it. But if you think those are strange, get ready to meet the Factory of the Strange. Number 1. Hobart's Funnies In the latter days of the Second World War, the British Army was seeking an edge. They created a unit to develop new tanks with enhanced features that would make up for the weaknesses their standard tanks faced during amphibious raids. Some delivered, while others were more curiosities than anything else. The unit commander, Major General Percy Hobart, would enter military history for just how strange his pet vehicles were. How strange? How about a tank with a curtain of mine flails attached to it? Or maybe the double onion? A tank with a massive metal frame holding demolition charges. It would be pressed against the wall and blown via a detonating cable after the tank retreated. Most of these tanks worked, but for only one specific purpose. So after the war, the British had a collection of the oldest, most unique military vehicles ever created. And hey, they won the war, so it's a great conversation piece. This episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Never forget another password and keep all your credentials secure by signing up for a free account today. They took her hometown and they killed her husband. She learned how to fight and how to use deadly weapons. She signed up to fight in the Soviet army after donating the money to build her very own tank. Avenging her husband's death to the Nazis in the Second World War, she fearlessly went into battle and took names. It sounds like a plot to a dramatic Hollywood movie, but the story of this extraordinarily brave Soviet woman is historic fact and not fictional fodder. She's one of the toughest, most badass women who ever lived, and today we'll take a close look at her. In this episode of the Infographic Show, Nazi killer Maria Oktyabrskaya.
Ukrainian Maria Oktyabrskaya was born to a peasant family on August 16, 1905. She was one of 10 children, so she must have learned a bit about fighting before her higher calling came later in life. Before the Second World War, she worked as a canner and then as a telephone operator, and in 1925 she married a Soviet army officer. That's when her interest in matters of a military nature began. She was trained as a nurse and became involved with the Military Wives Council. She learned how to use weapons and drive vehicles. During the Eastern Front War, much of her hometown was destroyed by the Nazis, and she was evacuated to Tomsk in Siberia, where she learned, in 1943, of her husband's death in battle with the Nazis near Kiev two years before. She took the news badly and decided to sell all of her possessions in order to donate towards the manufacturing of a tank aptly named Fighting Girlfriend for the Red Army. Maria wrote a hopeful letter to Soviet leader Stalin. It read like this. My husband was killed in action defending the motherland. I want revenge on the fascist dogs for his death and for the deaths of the Soviet people tortured by the fascist barbarians. For this purpose, I've deposited all my personal savings, 50,000 rubles, to the National Bank in order to build the tank fighting girlfriend and to send me to the front line as a driver of said tank. To her surprise, Stalin agreed. And after taking part in a five-month training program, Maria was, in fact, part of the war effort. She had somewhat of an edge on her fellow fighters, as most tank drivers and mechanics were sent straight out to the front line with little or no training. She was posted in the 26th Guards Tank Brigade as a driver and mechanic in September 1943 and began fighting battles in Smolensk. In her first battle, the 38-year-old widow took out some 30 Nazis and destroyed an anti-tank gun. She became accustomed to disregarding passive orders during battle to jump out of her tank and repair damages caused by gunfire. Due to her bravery on the battlefield, Maria was promoted to the rank of sergeant and her willingness to show courage both inside and outside of the tank drew admiration from her military peers. She was naturally accepted into the ranks by her comrades and as her reputation grew, the Russian media caught on to the story. She became part of the communist propaganda machine as something of a poster girl. She participated in what is thought to be the largest tank battle ever fought in human history, the Battle of Kursk. She swerved and evaded enemy fire while positioning her tank in a fashion that did the most damage to Hitler's forces. Maria was driven by the death of her husband and the destruction of her hometown and would not rest until she had eliminated every Nazi in her sights on the front line. She was fearlessly moving forward in her fighting girlfriend machine of war. In November 1943, the Soviet forces took the town of Novoye Selo at night, and Maria's reputation rose once more as a fearless Red Army force to be reckoned with. She could drive a tank as well as anybody, repair that same tank, fire guns, and toss grenades. She was, in short, a war machine. In January 1944, she fought again at night as part of the Leningrad Novgorod offensive and heroically powered forward in her T 34, destroying machine gun nests and a self propelled gun. Her tank was struck by a German anti-tank shell, and Maria leaped from her tank to undergo repairs. She repaired the tank, but was struck in the head by small arm fire, and was transported to a military field hospital near Kiev, where she remained in a coma for two months before finally dying on March 15th. She was subsequently made a hero of the Soviet Union for her bravery on the battlefield. Her memory lives on fondly in the hearts of the people for being one of the most badass female warriors of all time. While researching this video, we writers here at the Infographics Institute got kinda jealous. The big boss doesn't allow us to keep action figures, potted plants, or anything else in our pods, let alone have a cool office mascot. Also, the big boss stocks the bathroom with nearly see-through one-ply toilet paper. <clears throat> but that's a tale for another day. Corporal Wojtek was perhaps the coolest mascot one could wish for. Wojtek was a 6 foot tall, 500 or so pound brown bear that fought alongside Polish soldiers during World War II. In April of 1942, a group of Polish POWs newly released from a Siberian gulag were traveling by train throughout the Iranian mountains. They were headed to join the British allies in the Middle East during a stopover in Hamadan, Iran. Some soldiers shared food with a young Kurdish boy who had a large sack. The soldiers noticed that the sack was moving, and the child showed off his find. He had a scrawny little Syrian brown bear cub. He found it abandoned and thought that his mother had been shot by hunters. The soldiers pulled together their meager resources so that Lieutenant Anatol Tonovietsky could trade the boy for the bear cub. Reportedly, the bear was swapped for a chocolate bar, a Swiss army knife, a can of corned beef, and some other canned goods. Lieutenant Tarnovietsky kept the bear for a few months, eventually donating him to the soldiers of the 22nd Artillery Supply Company. The soldiers named the bear Wojtek, or Happy Warrior, 
They babied the cub, turning vodka bottles into impromptu baby bear bottles and feeding him condensed milk. As he grew, he was also fed fruit, marmalade, honey syrup, and beer as a treat. Wojtek quickly adapted to camp life. He wrestled with the soldiers, gathered around the campfire with them at night, and slept in their tents. The soldiers taught him to salute. He liked chasing down and eating the oranges the soldiers threw for grenade practice. Seeing how docile Wojtek was and the morale boost he brought to the soldiers, officers didn't mind having him around. He became the unofficial mascot of the company. Interacting with the bear was a pleasant distraction for the homesick soldiers, some of whom were barely more than boys. As Wojtek grew bigger and stronger, the soldiers would wrestle him two and three at a time. Sometimes they'd play tug-of-war. Wojtek also made friends with other animals in the camp, including a Dalmatian belonging to a British liaison officer. The bear and the dog would spend hours chasing and play fighting each other. The soldiers taught Wojtek to pick up men by their boots and dangle them upside down. It was a great way to haze unsuspecting rookies who thought they were going to get eaten by a bear. Wojtek copied much of the behavior he saw around him. He learned to stand on his hind legs and march along with the soldiers. He became skilled at drinking beer from a bottle. Also, he liked to eat lit cigarettes. He'd hold his mouth open for the cigarettes to be placed in, take a puff, and then swallow it. Some claimed that he would only accept cigarettes if they were lit and turn up his nose at unlit ones. Sure, today we'd call this animal abuse, but the soldiers loved the bear, and it was a different time. Apparently, Wojtek was a fan of coffee, too. Along with the 22nd Company, Wojtek was stationed in Iraq, Syria, and then Palestine, and eventually Egypt. The bear had a reputation for being mischievous and getting into all sorts of things. At an Allied Forces camp in Iraq, to the horror of some terrified women, Wojtek stole ladies' underwear off a clothesline. On Christmas Eve, after a traditional Polish feast where he and many of the other soldiers really enjoyed the wine, a drunken Wojtek broke into a camp storeroom. He trashed the room, spilling cooking oil and flour while looking for jam and other sweets. Wojtek also figured out how to get into the communal showers and turn on the taps. Unfortunately, he was really bad at rationing water, which was a precious commodity in the Middle East. Sometimes the shower-loving bear would cause water shortages. The army took to keeping the bathhouse door locked. Wojtek would hang around outside in hopes of getting in. One day in June of 1943, Wojtek noticed the bathhouse door had been left unlocked and ambled in. An Arab spy on a reconnaissance mission had hidden in the showers and was now face to face with the bear. The spy's screams of terror alerted the camp guards, who quickly took the man into custody. The spy was so afraid of Wojtek that he blabbed various secrets, including news of an impending raid, which the army then moved quickly to foil. As a result, Wojtek received sweetmeats, beer, and was allowed to take an extra long shower. In 1944, the Polish Corps shipped out from Alexandria, Egypt, heading to Naples, Italy, to fight alongside the British 8th Army. Unfortunately, the British ship the soldiers were to travel on had rules against allowing mascot and pet animals aboard. The 22nd Company got around the regulations by enlisting Wojtek in the Army. He was given the rank of private and had his own paybook and serial number. During the brutal Battle of Monte Cassino, Wojtek watched soldiers carry 100-pound crates of 25-pound artillery shells from the supply trucks to the front line. The bear quickly began copying the soldiers, standing upright and carrying boxes that would usually require multiple men to move. However, sometimes Wojtek was lazy and carried empty crates. The Allies won the difficult battle and Wojtek's actions earned him a promotion to the rank of corporal. Also due to his popularity, a depiction of a bear carrying an artillery shell was adopted as the official emblem of the 22nd Company. The emblem was put on vehicles, flags, pins, and uniforms. Once World War II ended in 1945, the 22nd Company, including Wojtek, were stationed at Winifred Airfield on Sunwick Farm in Scotland. Wojtek became popular with the locals, especially with the children and the press. In 1947, the Polish army demobilized and most of the soldiers returned home to Poland. They were heartbroken to say goodbye to Wojtek. The bear was sent to the Edinburgh Zoo. At first, the zoo decided to introduce him to the other bears, but it didn't work. Wojtek thought he was a human. As a result, he was given his own exhibit. Sometimes, Wojtek's former comrades would come to visit him. They'd hop the fence to his area and wrestle or cuddle with him. They'd also bring him beer and throw him lit cigarettes. The zookeepers noticed that Wojtek perked up whenever he heard Polish being spoken. Wojtek lived out the rest of his days at the zoo, passing away in 1963 at the age of 22. Both Edinburgh and Krakow have monuments featuring sculptures of Wojtek. The Imperial War and Sikorsky Museums in London also have memorials. This episode is brought to you by Skillshare. The first thousand people to sign up using the link in the description will get their first two months free. The Battleship.
ruler of the high seas up until and throughout much of World War II. With their combat roles escorting convoys to vital gunfire support to troops ashore, the battleship and battlecruiser played a central role in any nation's navy. So what were the mega ships that made up World War II's military machinery? That's what we'll find out today in this episode of the Infographic Show, Top 10 World War II Battleships and Battlecruisers. Number 10. One of four Admiral-class battlecruisers ordered in mid-1916 and commissioned in 1920, the HMS Hood was the last battlecruiser built for the Royal Navy. Named after the 18th century Admiral Samuel Hood, this ship had some design limitations, though it was revised and some improvements were made after the Battle of Jutland. In terms of the specifications, the hood was 860 feet long, had a beam of 104 feet, draft was 33 feet, and surface displacement 49,140 tons. It was propelled by 24 Yarrow small tube oil-fired boilers and four Brown Curtis single reduction geared quadruple screw steam turbines, delivering 144,000 shaft horsepower to four shafts, generating a surface speed of 29 knots, which is 33 miles per hour, and giving the ship a range of 5,399 nautical miles. Number nine, the Tennessee class was a class of battleships of the United States Navy, which comprised two ships, Tennessee and California. They were modified versions of the New Mexico class, featuring improved underwater torpedo protection and 30 degree elevation on their main batteries. Both ships survived World War II, but had been badly damaged during the attack on Pearl Harbor, and though some restoration work was carried out, they had to be scrapped shortly after. This class of ships was 624 feet long and able to hold a crew of 1,080 people. The beam was 97 feet, draft 30 feet, and surface displacement 37,200 tons. Propulsion was by turbo-electric transmission arrangement producing 26,800 shaft horsepower and driving four shafts, which was able to move this big hunk of metal at 21 knots, giving it a range of 7,995 nautical miles. Number eight, the French also had a large battleship during World War II, Jean Bart, named for the 17th century seaman, privateer, and corsair, Jean Bart. She was the second Richelieu-class battleship and designed to fight the new battleships of the Italian Navy. At the time, their speed, shielding, armament, and overall technology were second to none. Maximum crew was 1,200 in this 813-foot ship. She had a beam of 115 feet, draft of 31.5 feet, and a surface displacement of 35,000 tons. She was propelled by six Indrit Searle boilers with four Parsons gear turbines that delivered 150,000 horsepower to four shafts. This produced a surface speed of 32 knots, providing a range of 7,669 nautical miles. Number seven. On the subject of the Italian Navy, there's the battleship Roma. She was named after two previous ships and the city of Rome. Roma was deployed as the flagship of Admiral Carlo Bergamini in a large battle group that eventually comprised the three Vittorio Venetos, eight cruisers, and eight destroyers. She was sunk on September 9, 1943 by a German plane in an attack which killed 1,253 sailors with only 596 people surviving. The wreck was discovered in 2012 by an underwater robot named Pluto Pala, designed by Italian engineer Guido Gay. The ship was sitting on the seabed at a depth of around 3,300 feet. At full capacity, the Roma could carry 1,920 crew. She was 790 feet in length with a 108-foot beam, draft of 31 feet, and surface displacement of 46,215 tons. Propulsion was by eight Yarrow boilers feeding four steam turbines, developing 128,000 horsepower and driving four shafts. This provided a surface speed of 30 knots and a range of 4,580 nautical miles. Number six, Congo, was known as the Indestructible Diamond. She was a warship of the Imperial Japanese Navy during World War I and World War II and was the first battle cruiser of the Congo class among the most heavily armed ships in any navy when built. Her designer was the British naval engineer George Thurston. The Congo was torpedoed and sunk by the submarine USS Sea Lion while transitioning the Formosa Strait on November 21, 1944. She was the only Japanese battleship sunk by submarine in the Second World War. British newspaper The Telegraph reported in February this year that Japanese researchers believe they may have found the wreckage of the Congo at a depth of more than 1,300 feet, partly covered in sand and debris. Sonar images show a vessel standing 16 feet proud of the seabed. This ship carried 1,201 crew and was a length of 692 feet. The beam was 91 feet, 
Draft at 27 feet, surface displacement 26,230 tons. She was propelled by four shaft Parsons turbine and 10 boilers, topping a surface speed of 27 and a half knots with a range of 8,000 nautical miles. Number five, Bismarck was the first of two Bismarck-class battleships built for Nazi Germany's Kriegsmarine. Named after Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, the Bismarck and her sister ship Tirpitz were the largest battleships ever built by Germany and two of the largest built by any European power. On the morning of May 27th, the King George V and the Rodney, in an hour-long attack, incapacitated the Bismarck and an hour and a half later, it sank after being hit by three torpedoes from the cruiser Dorsetshire. Only about 110 of the crew survived. She was 824 feet long with a crew of 2,192. The beam was 118 feet, draft 32 feet, surface displacement was 50,900 tons. She was propelled by 12 Wagner high pressure steam heated boilers with three shaft blown and Voss geared steam turbines delivering 150,000 horsepower while delivering three shafts which produced a surface speed of 30 knots and a range of 8,099 nautical miles. Number four. Admiral Graf Spee was a German battleship that served with the Kriegsmarine of Nazi Germany during World War II. It was nicknamed a pocket battleship by the British. The Graf Spee was named after Admiral Maximilian von Spee, commander of the East Asia Squadron that fought the battles of Coronel and the Falkland Islands in World War I. In terms of her specifications, the Graf Spee had a crew of 1150 and she was 610 feet long. The beam was 70 feet, draft 19 feet. Her surface displacement was 16,200 tons and propulsion was provided by eight man diesel nine cylinder engines delivering two shafts at 56,000 shaft horsepower which ensured a surface speed of 28 knots and a range of 8,909 nautical miles. Number three, it's back to Japan next with the Fuso, the lead ship of the two Fuso class dreadnought battleships that was built for the Imperial Japanese Navy. She was launched in 1914 and commissioned in 1915 and initially patrolled off the coast of China. In 1923, she assisted survivors of the Great Kanto Earthquake. Then, between 1930 and 1935, and again in 1937 to 1941, the Fuso was modernized with improvements to her armor and her propulsion machinery. She could carry 1,198 crew with a length of 673 feet. Her beam was 94 feet, draft 28 feet, surface displacement was 36,500 tons, propulsion was provided by 24 Miyahara water tube boilers with two brown Curtis steam turbines developing 40,000 horsepower to four shafts. Refit, six water tube boilers with four steam turbines developing 75,000 horsepower to four shafts, which resulted in a surface speed of 23 knots and a range of 11,818 nautical miles. Number two, the USS Iowa is the lead ship of her class of battleship and the fourth in the United States Navy to be named after the state of Iowa. Iowa is the last lead ship of any class of United States battleships and was the only ship of her class to have served in the Atlantic Ocean during World War II. The Iowa has a colorful history that includes carrying President Franklin Roosevelt across the Atlantic to meet with Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin and bombing the Marshall Islands and Japan during World War II, bombing North Korea during the Korean War, and escorting oil tankers during the Iran-Iraq War. She is 887 feet long and could carry 1,921 crew, has a beam of 108 feet, a draft of 38 feet, her surface displacement was 48,500 tons, and she was propelled by eight water tube boilers with four General Electric geared steam turbines, delivering 212,000 horsepower to four shafts, creating a surface speed of 33 knots, which provided a range of 12,948 nautical miles. And finally, number one. As we've seen, the Japanese were known for having some awesome battleships, and the IJN Yamato was top of the class. She was the lead ship of battleships built for the Imperial Japanese Navy shortly before World War II. She and her sister ship Musashi were the heaviest and most powerfully armed battleships ever constructed, displacing 72,800 tons at full load and armed with nine 18-inch Type 94 main guns, which were the largest guns ever mounted on a warship. Yamato was designed to counter the numerically superior battleship fleet of the United States, Japan's main rival in the Pacific, and her end came in dramatic fashion as on her last mission she was involved in a suicide attack against American beachheads. Over 3,000 sailors died when she exploded and sank well short of her goal. 
She had 2,767 crew, was 801 feet long, had a beam of 121 feet, a draft of 36 feet, her surface displacement was 72,800 tons, propulsion provided by 12 Campon boilers feeding four shaft geared steam turbines, developing 150,000 shaft horsepower while driving four three-bladed propellers which ensured a surface speed of 27 knots and a range of 6,210 nautical miles. This all sounded quite technical, didn't it? If you have patience for so much detail, and you're a bit creative, we suggest you channel your talent into something cool like clay animation. But how does one even get started? Well, we know just the right class for that, and it's called Introduction to Clay Animation for Beginners. This class is offered by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community offering classes in leadership, photography, productivity, and more. Premium membership will give you unlimited access to topics that will improve your skills and in the process your life. The first 1,000 people to sign up by visiting Skillshare.com slash Infographics33 or by clicking the link in the description will receive two months of Skillshare absolutely free. Join Skillshare and start learning today. That's some pretty awesome battleships, but then again, we only touched on 10. Do you know other ships that are worth a mention? Be sure to let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to watch our other video called 10 Most Powerful Tanks. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.